A very good morning. Um, welcome, members. Welcome to the 29th meeting of the Criminal Justice Committee. There are no apologies this morning. And our first item is for the committee to decide whether to take item 7 in private. Are we all agreed? Thank you. So our next item of business is the conclusion of our evidence taking on pre-budget scrutiny of the Scottish Government's forthcoming budget for 2023 to 2024. And I refer members to papers 1 and 2. And I welcome to the meeting this morning Keith Brown, Cabinet Secretary for Justice and Veterans, Mr Neil Rennick, Director of Justice, and Mr Donald McGilvery, Director of Safer Communities with the Scottish Government. Uh, welcome to you all. So I'll just get underway and invite the Cabinet Secretary to make a short uh, opening statement and then we'll move to questions. Cabinet Secretary. Yeah, thank you, Convener. Uh, as you know, earlier this month in a statement on the emergency budget review, the Deputy First Minister set out very clearly the nature of the financial challenge that we face. The drivers of that challenge are well known, including Brexit, the ongoing impact of the COVID-19 pandemic, rising energy prices and high rates of inflation, I think 41 high uh, year yearly rate for inflation. Uh, and these pressures are impacting on households and on our vital public services. Many of those pressures were evident when the resource spending review and the update to the capital spending review were published in May and have become even more pronounced over the subsequent months. Inflation means that our budget has already fallen by 10% in real terms between this year and last, and the announcements in the UK Autumn Statement do very little to address the damage that this has done to the Scottish budget. Despite these pressures and the necessary realignment of our spending plans, we have worked this year to continue to support frontline justice services, and that includes support for the ongoing process of recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic with the number of outstanding uh, uh, trials reduced by over 10,000 between January and September this year. And in fact, those have been reduced even further since by around 12,000 down to around 31,000. And we're building on the success of the new digital approaches developed during the pandemic. For example, the new digital evidence sharing capability will enable evidence to be shared more efficiently and swiftly, helping cases to resolve earlier. We have also continued to modernise the prison estate with the opening of two new innovative community custody units for women in Glasgow and Dundee, reflecting our commitment to trauma-informed approaches to rehabilitation. Crucially, in the context of the cost crisis, we are supporting justice organisations to offer pay settlements well above the levels projected when our budgets were set at the start of the year. This is particularly significant and challenging for the justice portfolio, given the high proportion of our portfolio spending, over 70 per cent, which is committed to staffing costs. The resource spending review numbers for next year are not final budget allocations. Those will be set by the Deputy First Minister next month. But it would not be honest or beneficial to our justice services to pretend that exceptionally difficult choices will not have to be made across all portfolios, including justice in the final budget allocations. The funding outlined by the UK Government over the coming two years falls well short of the combined impact of COVID recovery, energy costs and inflation. So we will inevitably need to match our plans with the available resources. However, as far as is possible, my aims for the budget process remain those set out in our Justice Vision published earlier this year. And those aims include that we should continue the progress of COVID recovery in our courts in particular for the most serious cases in our solemn courts, that we ensure trauma-informed approaches for victims and witnesses, drawing on innovative recommendations such as those set out by Lady Dorian, and that we support our police and fire services to continue to deliver vital public services as they also modernise and adapt to changing demands. Also that we support the work of our legal professional and third sector services and that we invest in our prisons to support rehabilitation as well as effective community justice services, including alternatives to custodial sentences and remand. However, convener members of the committee will recognise that we will need to respond to these priorities within an increasingly tight financial context that is likely to last for an extended period. And with that, convener, happy to answer any questions the committee has, part, has as part of its pre-budget scrutiny uh, and to consider those issues in the ongoing budget process. Thanks very much, Cabinet Secretary. Um, so, as usual, I'll um, 
pick up uh, and open with a very general question, if I may. And you spoke about um, exceptionally difficult choices that will need to be need to be made in this next forthcoming year. I, I just wondered if there is any scope for deviation um, from the sort of totals that have been announced both within the resource spending review and obviously with the emergency budget. Um, and if there have been discussions about whether there is scope for some sort of deviation around the, the budget that's been allocated so far. Just to clarify, Convener, do you mean as between different portfolios? Is that, is that what you mean? I suppose with, with, within justice, within. yes, potentially. Right. Well, well, yes, potentially, uh, yeah. Yes, I mean, the resource spending review was based on uh, information um, coming from the UK government, and it was to try and give some kind of uh, path towards the next few years to give some context. But the budget itself is separate but related to that process. So as between portfolios and within portfolios, it is possible to change those uh, uh, naturally enough. Uh, and that is, if you like, part of the process that we're currently undergoing, the discussions with police, with fire, with um, the prison service. That process is ongoing now, so it's not fixed in stone uh, as per the RSR. I suppose the other, just leading on from that then, obviously one of the, in addition to sort of moving and adjusting figures, if you like, um, one of the things I'm quite interested in is opportunities for efficiency savings and sort of new ways of working. I'm just wondering if you can maybe just expand a little bit on what opportunities there are within the constraints of a very difficult budget for that to be very much part of individual portfolios um, thinking in terms of their budgets? It, it will be different in different parts of the portfolio, but I mentioned already in my opening statement some of the digital innovations which we've had and are looking to expand on. Uh, however, I do think it will also be necessarily the case that we will have to look to um, further public sector reform um, in order to try and um, fit in with those constraints, financial constraints which I've mentioned. And I know I uh, had discussions with the Chief Constable as recently as yesterday um, and with other services that they are actively considering things uh, which may help with uh, public sector reform, things which uh, are necessary to do anyway. Um, I would say, first of all, that the experience of fire and police in particular in terms of public sector reform, I think is an excellent example of public sector reform. It was a difficult decision to take around 10 years ago. There were difficult periods afterwards, if you think of the establishment of the uh, police and, and fire boards. I think, in my view, and having served on a police, um, a joint police committee in a local authority, the level of scrutiny now of the police is far greater than ever before. So they've already established very substantial public sector reform, but there will be more to come, and they're actively considering that, perhaps in relation to how the three blue light services can work more closely together, not least given the findings of the Grenfell inquiry. So that will happen uh, as well. So, thanks very much. And just one final question from me, just moving to capital uh, budgets. I, again, I'm just interested in um, some more commentary from you about the adequacy of the capital budget. Um, I think according to SPICE, some of the figures we have um, suggest that the uh, resource spending review would mean a cut of capital spending of 3.1% across the portfolio. I, I suppose as Cabinet Secretary, are there areas within that overall cut requirement that you would see as priority, not priority areas, but areas where um, it would be easier, as it were, to um, affect cuts um, that, than others? Uh, well, we're not proposing um, a cut, although I think you could argue that it may end up the case, depending on what happens. Um, whether you see a real terms increase. And that difference between real terms, accounting for inflation, and flat terms is a very important distinction to make. However, there are some flexibilities as between resource and capital, which we are examining very closely just now. If you take uh, one example, um, uh, body-worn cameras, um, there's obviously a capital cost to that, but there's also a substantial revenue cost. Uh, and we are trying to look to see what we can do in order to make sure that we maximise the capital contribution. I would say from my own experience, especially after the um, 
the early part of the last decade, I know that's going back in history somewhat, it seemed to be the case to me between 2010 and 2016 that you regularly had better capital allocations from the UK government than you had uh, resource allocations, and you also had fairly frequent allocations of financial transactions, which are quite limited now they can be applied. But what we're seeing now is a much closer um, grip tightening of uh, capital provision. Um, the indicative uh, capital funding envelopes has been maintained, though, um, just to make that point, uh, from the spending review published in February um, last year. That maintains essential capital funding for the core justice services, and that's always going to be the priority over uh, new initiatives, and that includes core services like estates, technology and fleet. We've also confirmed over £500 million of capital for our prisons, including the modernisation of the prison estate, which has been ongoing for some time. Uh, it is true to say, though, to go to your point, uh, convener, that the spending power of that capital budget has been eroded by inflation um, and now pays for significantly less as the cost of raw materials increases. But we do remain committed to substantial capital investment in the justice system and we have to keep it under review and it will be part of a discussion and negotiation with the different parts of the portfolio as to how that is done. Well, thanks very much. I notice you mentioned body-worn cameras in your reply, but I am going to open it up to, now to uh, members, and if we have got time, we will maybe come back to that later. Um, so, sticking on the theme of budgets, Katie, do you want to come in? Yes. It was just a, a brief question on the capital budgets and the modernisation of the, the prison service. We have heard some evidence, um, to put it crudely, that newer prisons are cheaper than older prisons. And can you hear me okay? Yes, uh, that newer prisons are cheaper than um, older prisons. Uh, is that something that you've looked at? And is there a business case for capital investment in that it actually makes, you know, that will help budgets in the future? I think it's not a, a new idea that if you uh, build something new according to modern standards, you can achieve efficiencies by doing that if you do it in the right way. Not least, you can also make it much more efficient in terms of the climate change challenge. So if you look at the proposed prison in the Highlands, HMP Inverness being replaced, that will be the first net zero prison that we will have. So, yes, of course, it can be the case you can make um, efficiencies. And we have had an ongoing programme now for a number of years of renewing essentially a Victorian estate, and we are going through that process. But, yes, there are. there are um, For each case, for each proposition that we have, there is a business case developed for that. Yeah. Thank you. Anybody else want to come in on budget? Uh, just quickly, based on net zero prisons, um, one of the things um, I've asked about regularly is about um, district heating systems. So, for instance, Berlini and the plans and um, the new prison as well. Would it, would you consider doing that? Because effectively, and I, I don't know all the technical details on it, but effectively you would be... Um, this, you would be providing, you know, energy for the prison, but out with that, the community and even industrial estates where you're actually generating income as well by having a district heating system within that public building. Uh, well, the intention, as I say, is to have uh, HMP Highland as the first uh, net zero prison. Uh, the development of a district heating system is probably out with just this portfolio um, deciding to do that for an individual institution. It would require the cross-government working that I think you're, you're hinting at, so with the uh, Cabinet Secretary for net zero. Um, and of course, I think your point is you, you probably have, especially in relation to Glasgow, a pretty large um, prison population, the largest one that we have, and whether it could produce wider benefits. So uh, we're still in the formative stages of that process towards um, Barlini. Um, but I don't know whether uh, Don wants to mention, mention any more. Neil. No. <laughs> Yeah, thanks, Cabinet Secretary. Yeah, just to confirm that, uh, that, that district heating is one of the options that ha has been looked at in terms of um, HMP Glasgow. As the Cabinet Secretary says, the, the design work on, uh, on the prison overall uh, is still in progress, and that's looking at a whole range of different opportunities that might be there in terms of providing benefits for the, the, local, the, the local community, but uh, you know, ensuring that it's environmentally efficient is one of the top priorities in terms of the, the design for HMP Glasgow. OK, thank you very much. Rona Mackay, I think you want to come in. Thanks, Thanks Convener. Good morning. Um, just, just on the, the, the question of HMP um, Glasgow, um, 
the, His Majesty's Inspector of Prisons, um, Wendy Sinclair -Gieben, Gieben, had said to us that um, she thought that there could be a delivery, um, a time slip delivery in the in the project because of uh, budget restraints. And I'm just wondering if you could comment on that. Would the gap be filled, and, and do you have guarantees that the, the new prison will be ready for 2026? I think what we've seen is, uh, and it's true across the UK, if you look at some large-scale capital projects, there have been delays uh, right the way across the UK. Uh, Brexit features prominently the pressures that Brexit has brought on supply chains and the pressures it's brought on uh, cost as well are very substantial. Um, so that is our intention to complete it on schedule, but of course it depends. And it's been delayed up to now, I think, as um, Paul McNeill has asked me questions about this in the past, the delays caused by the change in the prospective site that was going to be used in the new site. So uh, I do think we have to acknowledge, and I've said this from the very start in relation to uh, HMP Highland, we are to some extent at the mercy of external influences like um, Brexit, the supply chain issues that we have, the uh, labour shortages um, that we have. Um, so these are very real pressures and we're trying our best to withstand them and keep the programme. But I can't deny these are real pressures. Yeah. And, and just um, expanding that a wee bit, the new women's custody units, I think we've been reassured that they are going to go ahead as planned, the, the following on from the two that are already up and running. Is that the case in your view? In relation to those, as we want to see, first of all, how they're working, they are absolutely groundbreaking. There's nobody else that's done something like this. So I think it's only right that we make sure that they're having the intended effects before we move on to a further rollout. So that rollout was intended, mm -hmm. but it will be based on our experience with the two yeah. units which are now up and running. Great. And, and just the new national facility and uh, yes. HMP Stirling will be uh, on track for opening next year. Great. That's good to know. Um, and... Just one question, and I, I suspect my colleagues will have further questions on this. Um, the replacements for HMP Greenock and HMP Dumfries are, are not currently a priority in the, in the capital budget, I understand. Do you think they're going to be added any time soon? I know that's a kind of how long is a piece of string question, but um, are they still in the pipeline? It will depend on future uh, capital allocations. Mm. Um, what we have done at Greenock, because there are issues with the age of the institution, obviously, is carry out works in the meantime to make sure it's um, a, in a proper, proper habitable um, condition. But the, the idea of replacements uh, will depend on future uh, capital allocations, which, as I say, I think are as constrained as I can remember them being just now. OK, thank you. I know, I know my colleagues will have future other questions on that. Thank you. Right, thanks very much. I think um, Pauline, you're welcome to come in with some further questions on prisons, and then I'll bring in Jamie Green. Yeah, it was just a supplementary on the prison budget. So I put this question to the prison inspectorate, and that's in fact the SPS as well. So you'll know that the two private prisons, just by dint of the contract, which protects inflation, which no one ever thought would reach double figures, um, and I did put to um, Chief Executive that perhaps she needs to have a discussion with the private sector prisons about sharing some of the pain. Um, I wondered if that's something that you'd thought about um, or would it not be significant enough perhaps? But it just seems a bit unfair that two private prisons are protected financially but the public sector prisons are not. Yeah, I would say in relation to, uh, it's much more in relation to Adiwell than it is to Kilmarnock, um, because they have the indexation feature on the Adiwell one. And just to be perfectly blunt, it's not a contract I would have signed. Uh, I, I know in a different context, my local authority, small local authority, is now buckling under the pressure of the PFI for the schools that they had. And I think, as you said, when you have inflation, Going up now to a 41-year high, the impact that can have, I think potentially about £4 million a year, potentially, is very serious. We are involved in discussions, but I think it's only fair to say that the room for manoeuvre is extremely limited. Going back to the point I made about my local authority and schools, they tried very hard over the last number of years to try and renegotiate some of those things, and it's proven to be extremely difficult. And get-outs from these um, contracts can be very expensive in their own right. So, and to be fair to the people that signed that contract, they did it with that indexing in mind. Perhaps they would argue that they didn't expect to have a long period of low inflation. 
um, and they've they've managed that during the course of that time and they would expect the, the cost of inflation to be borne in the payments that we made to them because their overheads will be um, rising to that extent as well. So I think there is very limited scope, but we have been looking at it, or the, the SBS have been looking at it. Thank you. Thanks very much. Jamie? <clears throat> Thank you. I do have some wider budget questions, but seeing as we're on the subject of prisons, I may as well carry on the theme. Um, so we heard quite stark evidence from uh, HM Inspector for Prisons, uh, specifically around the Barlini and Greenock, um, and the warning was quite clear that if in the next inspection uh, the inspectorate is unhappy, then they would uh, recommend that the uh, prison faces the real potential of being closed due to health and safety. Um, some of the descriptions of it were quite disturbing. Um, but on a budget point of view, uh, she also made it clear by saying, I quote, the cost of maintaining it outweighs its value. And on Berlini, she also said that it costs a fortune to maintain the building because it is old. It's just a matter of time before the building collapses. So rather than looking at this in the silo of this year's budget, isn't this part of a bigger picture of what I would say is quite a chronic underinvestment in the prison estate, which has led to a situation where they are so expensive to run, therefore any factors such as energy price rises affect them more greatly? I think it's related to the point that Katie Clark made, which is that if you build new prisons, you can make them more efficient and you can make savings that way. I would acknowledge it, but you just can't get away from the hard fact of the capital allocations which the government has got. And those capital allocations, of course, have got to cover things like schools and uh, plants, machinery, um, cars, uh, vehicles for different services as well. Uh, I, you can't really get past it. You have to live within the envelope that you've got. I would say it's a false envelope. It was originally based on the Maastricht criteria, if you want to go back to that, the level of borrowing, and the UK wants to cap the total level of borrowing to that extent. Uh, but borrowing to, as you rightly say, borrowing to improve public facilities pays for itself in the long term. I agree with that, which is why we are replacing uh, Barlini. You know the programme of replacements and improvements that we've had across the prison estate. Generally, we're trying to work our way through that, but we can only really go at the pace of the money that allows us to do that. And that money, just to repeat the point from before, is going less and less far with inflation eating into it just now. But I do accept, if you can, as we expect to do, replace, for example, Barlini, um, we will make savings in the ongoing cost of that. Um, on the budget, I think in your opening comment, you said that your budget this year is looking at a real terms cut of 10% due to inflation. I just wondered if I could probe you on those numbers and, and how you came to that. So my understanding last year is that the 21-22 core grant block grant uh, budget was £36.7 billion and the 22-23 block grant is £40.6 billion. So that's roughly a 10% increase. So I understand that may, uh, the effect of that may feel negated, but I don't understand this 10% cut. Could you explain the numbers there? Well, first of all, we said, of course, that inflation is at 10 per cent and rising. The budget that we have for this year is worth around £1.7 billion pounds less than it was when it was announced in December. At that time, you'll know, of course, that inflation was around 4 per cent. Over and above that, we have, uh, because we're having to have pay settlements at a higher rate to reflect that cost of inflation, budget pressures so far, and I'm conscious that deals have yet to be done in terms of the prison service, teachers and nurses. We're talking around an extra £700 million of pressures for that alone. So that's reduced the value of the budget that we have. My figures are that it's a 2.6% reduction uh, going up to 5.2 uh, or 5.3% reduction in our budget when you take into account inflation. Uh, these are very real figures. We can't strip out the effects of inflation from the budget that we have. So. I don't know anybody that seriously contests the tightening of the budget. It's said by the Welsh Government, it's said by departments in the UK, uh, the pressures of inflation. And I think what's more worrying is that it seems to be the case that we're now embarking on a further phase of austerity, given the budgets that have been announced. So these are very real pressures. They can be checked in the public accounts. But those are my figures that I have in terms of the budget. Perhaps we can ask our colleagues in Spice to verify the figures that I have versus the figures that the Cabinet Secretary are using. Uh, I'm, I'm just trying to get to an understanding of how you came to the assumption that your budget is 10 per cent lower in value this year than it was last year, which says quite the opposite to the figures that I have. And that's notwithstanding the uh, £16 billion plus of Covid consequentials that were 
uh, given to the Scottish Government, which were uh, spent on various issues as well. Um, on the issue of pay rise, I think it's an important one. Um, it seems to be that your expectation is that the problems you're facing financially over the next few years are largely due to an expectation that the government will have to increase pay across the public sector. We heard from the Police Scotland specifically on what effect that has uh, in numerical terms. So they forecasted that even a 5% pay rise per annum over the next four years uh, would cost £220 million. And to pay for that, that would equate to the loss of four and a, around 4,500 officers to fund it. So, in other words, for every 1% pay rise that is awarded to the force equates to around 1,000 police officers that would have to be lost to fund it. Is, a, is that of, of, of concern to you? And B, how do you think the government will approach the issue of pay rises, given that it, it's larger outside of your control? Uh, well, the approach to pay rises will necessarily have to take into account inflation. There are projections which you'll know from the UK government which start to see a significant fall in inflation during, I think, the middle part of next year, if memory serves me correct. So I think the approach to pay rises will inevitably try to take into account the real cost of living for people as we go forward. Uh, and briefly, yes, of course, there's a correlation between the impact of pay rises and our ability to pay for them and the overall budget. Um, I've mentioned already that in the justice portfolio, around 70 per cent of our costs are people costs, you know, whether it's uh, salaries directly, pension or other costs. So these costs are very significant and they do squeeze out the opportunity to do other things. But I think in relation to the pay settlement we uh, reached this year, and I would imagine the same process would inform how we have, uh, how we approach further pay rounds. Um, we do recognise that police officers, prison officers, uh, firefighters face these cost of living increases, energy cost increases. So we're trying our best to reflect that within the budget that we have. Um, but that squeeze that you've mentioned, the correlation between if you pay more for pay, it squeezes other things. Of course, that's... I don't recognise the figures, I would say. I don't agree with the figures. Um, we have seen this year, uh, as I've mentioned already, so far £700 million of additional pressure. We've not seen a reduction in police officers caused by that. We have seen a reduction in police officers caused by the fact that Tully Allen was being used for COP26 and the restrictions of COVID, but it's now back up to the regular 300 intakes that it had previously. Um, but, yeah, uh, it, there's no doubt there's a correlation between what you pay for pay. I don't think anybody's projecting exactly what they're going to do, any government's projecting what they're going to do for pay over the next three or four years. But it's also true to point out the perhaps obvious point that the 5% pay increase this year doesn't disappear next year. It's built upon. Um, so these pressures will grow. And it's, it's our job to make sure that the police service, in terms of its establishment, in terms of the number of officers, does not fall below the level that we think, and more importantly, the Chief Constable thinks is necessary to do the job. A, a loss of 4,500 officers, though, would clearly have a stark effect on Police Scotland's ability to form its not just statutory duties, but basic functions. We heard that, quite frankly, that police simply wouldn't turn up to certain types of crime, uh, low-level crime, as, as it's often called, and we'd only respond to the most serious of events due to simply being short of bodies and boots on the ground, and, and that clearly will come as a concern to the public. So it seems to me that the, the, what the issue that's facing government is either concede to the demands for pay rises or simply say that there is a cap on how much money is available uh, and therefore have to accept the consequence. The consequence could be industrial action, as we've seen already, um, or indeed... Uh, officers leaving uh, the force, or indeed firefighters and other public service workers uh, looking elsewhere for employment. So how, how will the government approach those negotiations, given that they're under, uh, I, I would say, quite substantial pressure to concede to demands made, not just by unions, but by others? Uh, well, I'm grateful you acknowledge the pressures which are there, and you mentioned uh, without putting a cap. There is a cap. There's a cap on all that we do. Um, whether it's a block grant added to by what uh, tax that we raise here and, and other sources of income. So the cap is there already. There's always been uh, that cap. And you're right, the question is how do you marry those uh, pressures? I should say that I have no intention of overseeing a budget for the police force that results in 4,000 officers leading the police force. Um, uh, I would also say that it's, despite press reports to the contrary, we have got a very stable workforce in the police in Scotland, much more so than other parts of the UK. Um, we've got real interest uh, in applying for senior positions within the police force here uh, as well. 
And the point about not turning up for things, we've seen that's happened in many communities uh, south of the border where there's been uh, no investigation of burglaries and other crimes in some communities for over a year. Um, and no intention of holding those investigations. We don't intend to oversee uh, that. However, I think it is true to say from the discussions I've had both with the SPA and with the police, they want to make sure that the model of policing that they have is uh, up to date and fit for what's going forward rather than always looking back. And I would just say that it is worth pointing out they start from a very strong basis <clears throat> where a police constable in Scotland will get around £5,000 more per year when they start. Every rank up to assistant chief constable is paid higher in Scotland than elsewhere. They've got some of the lowest ever recorded levels of crime. So they start from a strong position and they don't intend to yield that position. I think, um, based on the discussions I've had, there will be a reprioritisation. Cybercrime is a, is a real challenge and I think the police will want to do more in terms of cybercrime. Violence against women and girls, there may be a reconfiguration about how the police would want to do that as well. So it will develop over time, but they're not going to have that level of fall off of officer numbers, at least the officer numbers, um, a, a net fall off of 4,000 officers. We don't intend to see that happen at all. I'm happy to let others. Um, Thanks very much. Um, I'm going to just come back. There's a, a, I know Russell Finlay is wanting to come back to questions around prisons, and then we can maybe pick up questions around um, policing uh, after that. So, Russell, over to you. Yeah, I mean, the more the Cabinet Secretary talks, the more questions I have, so I'll try and remain focused. But I wanted to just begin with a budget question. Um, the Evidence we've heard in the committee these last few weeks has been nothing short of shocking. The police service, the fire service, the courts and the prison service all making pretty stark warnings about what might happen with these proposed cuts. Um, we don't yet know what next year's, uh, the exact de details of next year's block grant, but we do know there will be an additional £1.5 billion which has been generated by health and education spending elsewhere in the UK. Given what we've heard facing justice, will you ask your First Minister, the Government, whether some of that money can go to head off some of the crises facing the justice system? Well, of course, there will be very substantial uh, calls on the Government to do many things, not least from your own party, demanding um, as ever that health consequentials are passed on directly to health and uh, don't pass go. And I concede that's the government, this government's priority to make sure that health consequentials go to health. Uh, the £1.5 billion pound over two years, um, which is mentioned, I've just mentioned the £1.7 billion pounds additional cost that we face this year by the erosion of inflation. So there is no question this is a bonanza that we can all um, expect to resolve the pressures that we have in our different portfolios. But I will fight my corner for the justice budget, uh, for the police, for firefighters, for prisons and others, for the court service, where I think we're doing tremendous work. A reduction of 12,000 cases is astonishing, I think, in one year in terms of summary cases. So, of course, I'll fight my corner in relation to that. But there are, um, well, first of all, the, the first word you used was shocking. I do think it's shocking, the budget settlement we've had from Westminster. Given that many different departments, not just Scotland and Wales, have said the pressures that we're facing this year are extraordinary. I'm sure you know the situation the Scottish Government can't change taxes during the course of the year. We can't increase borrowing to pay for uh, pay. So to have a £1.7 billion, pounds, uh, if you like, diminution in our budget without that being recognised, I think is shocking and is the source for some of the pressures, many of the pressures that we currently face. But it's my job to make sure that justice um, is well served by the budget process and that we maintain and improve the public services that we have through justice portfolio. Instead of you know, blaming the UK government for all Scotland's uh, ills, let's get on the record that the UK block grant is a record £40.6 billion, pounds, and it's entirely up to your government how they choose to spend that money. Uh, we've heard dire warnings from across the justice system about failures to spend money, not this year, but in many years gone by. We've got fire stations in a state of serious disrepair, putting firefighters at risk. We've got courts. Uh, needing uh, work done to them. We've, in the time of Police Scotland's creation, we've had 140 police stations shut down. Uh, so I think we need to be a little bit more honest with people about the choices your government has made. Now, turning to the issue of prisons, 
the prison inspector, as well as issuing the warnings about the state of Greenock and the possibility of calling for it to be shut down, as touched upon earlier by Jamie Green, she also said that the transfer of HMP Kilmarnock from the private to public ownership should be paused, and she suggested that the reason for this uh, happening was ideological on the part of your government. Do you have any response to what she said about this? Uh, yeah, just to respond to your first point, uh, where you said that, although I didn't actually say I blamed, blamed the UK government for all the problems in Scotland, just to put it in context, this is not just Scotland or the Scottish government that's saying this. The Welsh government says this. Different departments in the UK government say this. It is impossible to meet the increasing demands, a huge rise in inflation by the, due to the economic incompetence of the government that you support, I have to say. We can't wish away those costs um, and to try and pretend. You argued for honesty. Let's be honest about the source of this. Everybody else knows uh, where the source of this, uh, the main pressure comes from. So let's, let's have that honesty at least. And also let's have the honesty that says, are you arguing for increases in budgets against that background in virtually every activity of government is not honest. I think we all know that's not honest. To come back to the point about Kilmarnock, um, we stood in the manifesto in 2007 in saying that we believed it was fundamentally the case that prisons, given the nature of prisons and the service they provide, should be within the public sector. Decisions on Kilmarnock and Adiwell were taken before this government came into office, so it's no surprise that we, we would wish to take this uh, uh, Kilmarnock, and we've made it clear that we intend to take Kilmarnock back into the public sector, which is where we believe it should be. Going back to Kilmarnock, if indeed it's now the case due to the financial situation and the pressures of inflation, which of course are a worldwide problem, I'm sure the Cabinet Secretary would acknowledge, given these extreme uh, global circumstances regarding inflation, is it not worth looking again at the Kilmarnock transfer? Uh, well, SPS are engaged in discussions with the... Uh, main contractor, uh, the subcontractor uh, being Serco, they've been involved in those discussions, but it's not around. It's really around the the transfer um, uh, being affected um, in a way that obviously looks after the uh, interests of the staff, but looks after the safety of prisoners as well. So they're embarked on that process, and the member rightly mentions inflation, the cost of inflation, the idea that. We would somehow avoid those costs of inflation where we were to go back to the, or maintain the private contractor. I don't know any, know any private contractor that would want to bid for a contract that didn't recognise the cost of inflation. And we've seen that in relation to the exchange I've had with Paul McNeill over Adiwell as well. So, and bear in mind that the Kilmarnock iteration of PFI was many years, nine years I think, before uh, the deal was done for Adiwell. Uh, by which time uh, contractors were very keen to make sure that the inflation costs were part of the bid that they made. So I'm not sure there'll be the savings which are being hinted at by trying to ignore inflation. But in any event, it is this government's position that we believe prisons should be in the public sector. Thank you. Thanks very much. I'm just going to stay on, try and stay on this theme of prisons at the moment, and then we can move on to um, another area of questioning. And I'm going to bring in Pauline... Uh, McNeil, Pauline. Mine is on police. Sorry? My, my question is on the police budget. I, I beg your pardon. Um, OK, any other questions on prisons before we move on? Colette and then Jamie. Um, just again, touching upon the evidence that was given by <coughs> Wendy Sinclair Gibbon. She mentioned about the contract for GO Amy in terms of the transportation of, of prisoners to and forth. And you did touch upon it, um, Cabinet Secretary, in terms of improving uh, digital um, and IT in terms of, you know, a, you know, online court appearances and things like that as well. Is that, and I know that it is, it's, it's a 10-year contract, I believe, or was a 10-year contract. Is that something that you've given consideration to in terms of efficiency savings going forward we're reducing the transport, given that it isn't fit for purpose? We have seen a substantial reduction, obviously, with the COVID restrictions over time and um, the lessening of the need to appear in person for many of these uh, practices. But I think I've had quite extensive uh, discussions with Wendy, and it's um, quite evident that the biggest problem that GOE Amy have is a general problem of staff. Uh, it's a staffing issue. Um, and we've had a couple of suggestions as to how they might best um, address that situation. Um, so the SPS are working closely with them to try and deliver that 
prisoner transport system that supports the justice system and protects the public. They are developing quite creative modelling to lessen the impact of the staffing issues, including scheduled weekly meetings to develop short, medium and long-term plans to improve the contractual delivery um, and maybe uh, get Neil to confirm the length of the contract. But as per the contract, performance, performance levels are monitored by the SPS and any service failures uh, are managed within the terms of that contract. We are aware that there are around 70 staff short of the requirements um, needed to meet their prisoner escorting contractual agreement. Um, so these things have to be managed. We don't think, just to be perfectly clear, that GEO Amy are at it. We know the pressures there are on getting staff, uh, and we're trying to work our way through that. And as for the length of the contract, I don't know if you know. Um, I can't remember. We'll, uh, confirm, confirm that. that. Thank you very much. Okay. Jimmy Green. Thank you. Uh, just uh, carrying on prisons. Um, so we had two evidence sessions on prisons, one with Scottish Prison Service directly and the other, were, other with HMIP. Um, we heard evidence that uh, if the current forecast for budget comes to fruition, it may result in a situation where prisons have to revert into COVID-like lockdown scenarios. And that was described as a situation where prisons are effectively held in their cells much of the or all of the day. Uh, there would be a cancellation of purposeful activity, uh, third sector organisations coming into prisons, um, and also a reduction in rehabilitation, mental health and addiction treatment services as well. Um, HMIP described that as a scenario where people will leave prison more angry than they went in, which clearly is in no one's interests, no least public safety. Uh, how would you respond to those warnings? Yeah, well, we have no intention of... Um if you like, the SPS seeing it as a necessity to resort to those kind of uh, restrictions. Uh, and I would have to say I'd, I'm delighted to put on record my thanks to prison staff that have managed during the pandemic when those restrictions were in place. The potential for very substantial unrest because of those restrictions was always there and yet it's been met very successfully by the uh, prison staff who've done a tremendous job. We have no intention of seeing that kind of restriction apply. In fact, if you look at the, um, I imagine it may be the case we'll get into the issue of um, mobile phones for prisoners today, for example. But that and a number of other innovations were designed to make sure that that pressure wasn't felt and that where, in that case, where restrictions were being put in place, that prisoners could still communicate with their families and so on. So I think our whole approach is to avoid that kind of uh, restriction, which we'd unnecessarily um, uh, exacerbate uh, the situation in prisons. And just to give uh, one uh, anecdote, if I could, a colleague uh, who's recently joined the Scottish prison, uh, uh, joined the Scottish government, had been uh, part of his experience of being to go to prisons in the south east of England and Midlands. And he said the contrast is marked the calmness that he found when he visited Perth prison in particular, which I think is a testament to both the prison service and the way that we've tried to organise things. So. We would not want to do uh, as has been suggested, and it is our responsibility to make sure that SPS don't feel they have to do that. I acknowledge that, but we would not want to do that because the consequences of uh, substantial unrest in prison, apart from anything else, would be substantially more expensive than some of the things that we're doing. So, mm. I know that I know that pressure is there, but we don't intend to um, see those restrictions introduced for that reason. But but the restrictions would be introduced as a byproduct of financial restrictions. So. Uh, they stated that quite clearly that they, and I quote, they cannot manage against a flat cash settlement without significant adverse impact. Um, so, is it the likelihood then? And I know it's difficult to preempt what what your final budgets will look like. But would your expectation be to move money from other areas of the Justice Directorate budget towards the prison service to avoid that scenario, or simply to go uh, to the Finance Secretary and ask for money from other uh, government departments to, to fund those because if you're making that commitment today and it's one of a number of commitments that you've made that you, of what you don't want to see happen then it's clear that simply more money is needed mm. so, so what I'm seeing today so in relation to the previous question you asked about whether there be 4,000 fewer police officers I'm saying that's not what I intend to see um, and I'm also saying that I do not intend to see in prison the prison service restrictions of the nature that you've described resulting from financial pressures mm -hmm. Who knows in terms of future pandemics and so on. 
So I do accept that I've got a, to be accountable for those statements I've made. But you will know as well that I can't preempt the budget, and also there's two steps really here which are significant. First, what we can manage to get for the budget, as distinct from the uh, indications of the resource spending review for for justice. That's obviously partly my responsibility. And the second stage of that is within the justice portfolio. However, it's uh, used to make sure those things don't happen. So if they do happen. You know, I, I'm accepting my part of the responsibility for that, but it's my intention to make sure those two phases, the justice disposition in terms of the budget when the DFM uh, makes those um, decisions, and secondly, how we manage that budget. We have to live within that budget, whatever else is said, to make sure that those things don't happen, and that's my intention. Thank you. Thank you, Thank, Thank you very much. OK, if there are no more questions on prisons, I'm going to move us on to uh, policing, and Pauline, I'll bring you back in. Um, good morning, Cabinet Secretary. So you, you said to Jamie Green you had no intention, in fact you said it twice, of presiding over uh, a drop of 4,500 officers, so well, I'm pleased to hear that. I just wanted to drill down a little bit on what discussions you're then having with the Deputy First Minister about it. But I'm sure you share the same concerns as the committee or myself, which is that the submission that Police Scotland gave us um, and Chief Constable has said this quite openly. It's not simply the drop in numbers that's a big concern. It's that, um, as we've discussed many times, the Scottish Police Service is quite special, actually, in the UK and internationally, because of the type of policing that we have here. Not just the one-on-one -on -one service, but you know that it's figure something like actually 26%, maybe 28% of calls are crime-related. So many... Police is very much a line of last resort. You know this, you've heard that many exchanges we've had. So I was wondering what kind of discussions are you then having within Cabinet and the Deputy First Minister about how we can avoid this drop? And just a thought, actually. Um, <laughs> even if you could find money in the budget, it just seems to me that given the period ahead, to protect that and preserve that model of policing for the future is such an important thing. And I just wondered if you're getting this across to the Deputy First Minister. It isn't just a straight flat cut and a cut in numbers. We could lose this model of policing for all time because, you know, when you change things, you don't come back to where they were. Uh, yeah, I, I, I'm not going to go into detail of the discussions which I've had uh, with the DFM both up to this point this coming week. Uh, and in the period before the budget. But those points are being made, and I, I very much agree with Paul McNeill. If you look at, uh, for example, the way that Police Scotland dealt with COVID, uh, COP26, um, Operation Unicorn, is an extraordinary record of achievement, in my view. And not many other police forces, I think, could have achieved that. And again, to your point, internationally, that is registered with other police forces around the world. The policing by consent the model they have compared to some of the models that you see, for example, in some parts of the United States. So there's a lot of interest in the way that Police Scotland managed to uh, conduct themselves during those uh, very pressured times. But COVID is a key one, I think, to the point that, that you raised, because they moved into a space then, which was often to do with health. Um, and I think it's a, it's a, a, a symbol of the trust that people in Scotland have in the police, that they were seen as the first point of contact. Um, but that has meant, I think you're right, that they now have uh, this expanded role, which the Chief Constable has always wanted, of well-being and safety for the environment rather than just uh, for, for the uh, population, uh, rather than just law enforcement. Crucially, though, when it's a health-related issue, I think we've got to get better at the handoff to health authorities. And I mentioned at the start about some of the further iterations of reform that which might come about in terms of uh, call handling and a uh, more liaison between the blue light services. So I think you're right, there's an additional pressure which has been absorbed by the police and I'm involved in discussions about how we can better manage, say for example, the classic example of somebody in a severe mental health distress, it'll often be the police that have to attend there when, fair enough if they attend, but they should be able to make sure the professionals put in place as quickly as possible, rather than say a police officer having to be there for an extended period of time. So. I think that is a challenge. I, you know, I concede that is a challenge that we have to meet, and that is featuring in the discussions within Cabinet um, uh, as things go forward, and we'll do in the ramp to the budget as well. Mm -hmm. 
I appreciate that you, you know, I'm really asking you to disclose the detailed discussions. I'm really not. <laughs> but I suppose I'd like some reassurance that in these discussions, then, given what you've said, you, don't, you want to protect police numbers and you want to protect the police model. The only way that can really be done is to have some kind of plan. It's not this one. <laughs> um, can you reassure us about that? That there is a plan that the cabin that is supportive of, or how far could you go? Well, that's exactly the nature of the process. Although that plan, uh, specifically in relation to policing, has to acknowledge the central role of the chief constable and the SPA. So, as recently mm -hmm. as yesterday afternoon. There are extensive discussions on these very issues with the uh, chair of the SPA and with the chief constable. Uh, and that will be the intention, to make sure that plan is one which um, uh, Cabinet can support, the government can support, hopefully Parliament can support in due course. So, yeah, they're, they're very live issues, very much along the lines that you've described, have been discussed now. Um, and just one final question. I mean, there's many areas, I suppose, you can look at the budget to, to do, where you could find savings. And the one that always comes up is court time for police officers having to give their rest days up and all the rest of it. To what extent do you think that is being resolved by the ingenuity of technology? Or uh, how far down the road do you think we are with this? Is it something that can assist here? It's a very good point, and obviously the member's been talking to the police who will tell you about the time, the frustrations they feel about the time that's tied up in court, sometimes for cases that don't happen. Um, so we have the pilot, and Neil can say more about this. We have the current pilot in Dundee, Hamilton Paisley. and Paisley. Um, what we said in relation to that pilot is so urgent is the need to address this, is that the very earliest point that we see promising outcomes from that, that's to do with the way cases are managed, we want to roll that out across the whole of Scotland. And again, that's part of a discussion we've had from the Chief Constable. But it might be worth just hearing from Neil a bit more about the detail on that. Yeah, just briefly, I mean, a lot of these issues are discussed collaboratively through the, the, the Criminal Justice Board that the, the Crown Agent and the Chief Executive of the Court Service spoke about. So specifically in terms of, of police officer time, there are a number of different actions being looked at um, to try and respond to that. One of those is obviously the continuing work we're doing around dealing with the uh, the COVID backlog and working that down and the, the more that we can move through that then that will help reduce the number of police witnesses that are having to come forward over time and as the Cabinet Secretary said a reduction of over 12,000 this year in those cases and with the, the, the time scales that they're looking at the aim is to try and have that backlog uh, for summary cases resolved by March 2024 and for many courts well ahead of that. And that will reduce the number of uh, summary court hearings that have to be held. Second element we're looking at is around uh, the, the development of uh, remote witness um, uh, for police officers so that they're able to provide their witness statements to the court remotely from police offices so they're not having to wait in the, the, the court. And then, as the Crown Agent and the, the, the Court Service Chief Executive said, the pilots that are being taken forward offer real potential for resolving cases more, more quickly at an earlier stage and reducing the number of police officers who have to be cited for court evidence. And the intention behind that is to run the pilots, but fairly quickly, given the, the kind of positive evidence so far, try and roll those out on a rolling basis across um, other courts so that the impact of that is being felt during 23 Just 24. a very quick comeback on that. Um, you know that I raised this question during the passage of the, the COVID uh, legislation about what I thought was um, pretty dreadful circumstances of remote <laughs> um, working in the Sheriff Court because the quality was so poor. Presume then that, um, and I'm delighted that the government uh, did act on that. So that's going to, going to be for restricted purposes now, but not for full custody hearings. But is that something, yes or no, that you're able to address to ensure? Because there's no point in having it remotely, which I don't have an issue with, but I do have an issue with if the quality of that connection is so poor that it's actually going to undermine the whole idea of it. 
the police remote witnesses is, is a different uh, is a different issue from the wider question around um, uh, around virtual uh, virtual hearings. And obviously, we've, we've had years of experience of witnesses providing evidence remotely, particularly vulnerable witnesses from the the witness suite. So that's something that the court services uh, experienced the IT, then. in terms of the the, the elements of uh, remote witnesses. And obviously, during the COVID pandemic, we provided extra capital resource to the court service <coughs> specifically to assist them with with that and again it's, it's one of the things that I would highlight as being one of the you know the tragic circumstances of COVID but um, the, the justice organisations innovated with things like the, the remote jury centres you know learnt how to use technology remotely so there are benefits that we're making sure that we're we're not losing from the, the circumstances of COVID. Thank you thank you very much. Okay thanks very much. Fulton I think you want to come in now. Yes. It's on this point, it was an issue I was going to raise, so it, it ties in uh, nicely to Pauline McNeill's line of questioning. And I've actually had some contact uh, from uh, police officers locally this morning, and they know about, they, they know about this session. And the, the vast, I, I suppose, almost a plea, they, they know that resources are tight, things are going to be difficult. But this issue of going to court, they're asking a real plea here that they think that this could be massive in terms of uh, the, the amount of time that they're spending in court is huge. That's, that's the exact word used in the text. And I suppose it's a plea really there. If this could somehow be sped up and um, improved, the, the officers on the ground are thinking it could be uh, you know, game-changing in that respect in terms of freeing up resources. The other issue, <clears throat> which isn't quite related to um, Pauline's point, but it's still in police time. And another thing that they asked me to raise, because they asked for two specifics, is they feel that they're, re they're spending a lot of time covering for the ambulance service just now as well. Um, and we know the pressures that they'll be facing. Um, but this was something that else... That, so these are the direct things I've been asked to raise today. Uh, and you've already answered the point about the, um, the, the, the time in court. Um, so I appreciate I don't need enough further response on that, but it's more a plea if we could get that speeded up, I think. It could be good for everybody, the justice system as a well. whole. Well, can I just yeah. come back to say, can you, that I think that's the point we're saying, that this pilot, uh, the normal course of a pilot would be to conduct a pilot, analyse it, see the impact and benefits, and then if that's the decision rule, out, we're not doing that in this case because of the pressures that you've mentioned, and I get the same from uh, police officers. They're frustrated having to spend time sitting in court or in anterooms at the courthouse for cases that sometimes are not even called when they could be doing other police work. So we, Chief Counsel has made that point to me. Um, but this pilot will be rolled out in advance of that uh, longer time period we normally have. Uh, and on the second point, I think I've already mentioned a couple of times that the blue light services and closer working between them was, apart from anything else, one of the outputs from the Grenfell inquiry. Um, but there is obviously the case there's more that can be done there, so that's an active consideration that we're giving to that just now, not just between, say, the ambulance service and the police, but also the, the fire service as well, how we can make that more efficient um, in a country of Scotland's uh, size. <coughs> OK, thanks very much. Um, Katie, I know that you're indicating you, you want to indicate, um, want to come on in the back of this particular line of questioning, and then I'll bring in Colette. I mean, on policing, it's about body-warm um, cameras um, because Police Scotland have told us that funding would only ensure 500 specialist police arms officers in Scotland would have body-warm cameras and that a flat-rate settlement would inhibit the rollout. I mean, as you know, in England and Wales, um, police officers already have this kit and indeed are moving on to the second generation. Um, so could you maybe outline where you are in this issue and what discussion is taking place and whether you are looking at something beyond 500 and ensuring the whole force is equipped? Well, first of all, it's probably important to say that, as I'm sure the member knows, that body-worn cameras incur both a capital and a revenue cost. Um, where, the, where the information gathered by the body-worn camera goes is quite an important consideration uh, and the logistics behind that. So it has impacts for both the capital budget and the revenue budget. Uh, of course, the ultimate decision on that rests with the Chief Constable, but I acknowledge that will depend on the resources that he has. I would say, though, that uh, you've drawn a comparison with south of the border. Um, we are a bit different in Scotland than as far as the proportion of the budget, the police budget, which is spent on people, is higher in Scotland, substantially higher. Um, and that does provide pressure on the remainder of the budget as to what else you can do with that. We've had representations 
from the Police Federation and others saying that the priority for them and their one stakeholder was um, pay and the conditions of officers, such was the pressure they've been under and, of course, the impact of the cost of living. So we've res responded to that. And it's also true to say we can't spend that money twice. So I acknowledge the financial constraints that are there. I'm a supporter of body-worn cameras. I think they can actually achieve savings in the longer term for various reasons, which you'll be aware of. But we have to live within the resor resources that we have. Ultimately, though, a decision on further role it will be for the Chief Constable to take. Thanks very much. I'm going to bring in Colette. I think you want to ask something else. Yeah, there, um, there has been um, pilot schemes being run um, for, like, almost like um, a, a mental health for, you know, emergency response team. Um, would that alleviate um, the, the attendance of police officers or even other emergency services as well? Because I know, having spoken to some of our local police officers, that they said a lot of the times they're having to attend um, for mental health people who are obviously in complete distress as well. So are you actively talking with the Minister for Mental Health in terms of how that can alleviate the strain on Police Scotland? Um, and, and how that would roll out, uh, or when it's likely to roll out? Uh, y yes, uh, that discussion continues. I mean, uh, discussions with the um, Minister for Mental Health is also in relation to prisons and how we can better deal with some of the issues in prisons as well. But I think it's probably important to acknowledge that some of the pressures the police feel through that are, first of all, when the call comes in, whether that call can be better then passed on to somebody with a mental health background, However, it is sometimes the case that the police, people go to the police because they think that's where they need to go and the police can get there sometimes more quickly in an emergency situation. What is of more concern, at least expressed to me by the police, is how long they then have to stay with that case before being able to hand it to somebody with a mental health expertise. So it's that area and the call handling uh, and how quickly a mental health professional gets involved are the main areas that we're looking at just now and that's part of cross-portfolio discussions. Can I just uh, quickly ask uh, an additional question on that? Has there been, like, is it triage cars where, where they're able to attend directly rather than putting that onus on the police? So, so mental health professionals will attend directly? Yeah. I'm not, I'm not aware of that, perhaps, Tom. So, so the thing I'm aware of is that there, are, um, there has been mental health professionals put into police call centres to help with the triage at the call centre point. Um, there may be some local initiatives, uh, maybe what you're referring to. Um, I, I, I'm certainly not aware of a national scheme on that, but we can, I, I can find out more from police and, and, and let the committee know if that would be helpful. OK, thank you very much. OK, I'll bring in Russell Finlay now. I think you've got, yeah. still got some police questions. Indeed. Um, so everyone in Scotland benefits to the tune of £2,000 per head in additional public spending to others in the UK, which I'm sure the Cabinet Secretary is very grateful for. And this helps, presumably, pay our police officers more than they get paid elsewhere in the United Kingdom. Um, but despite this, as we've heard from the evidence in the last few weeks, Police Scotland uniquely do not have body-worn cameras, as Katie has already pointed out. These are in every force in England and Wales. Some of them are in second-generation cameras. David Page says these would have massive benefits and they're supported by 81% of the public. Now, the cost of these is uh, estimated to be about £25 million. Is it a priority to now get this, get these implemented as a matter of urgency in order to protect officers and protect the public? I think Perhaps covered that off, Cabinet Secretary, in your previous answer, but I'm happy if you wish to follow well, maybe, maybe up. Maybe I'll, that's... I'll ask it differently. I mean, I'm sure there's no. I'm, I'm sure that you I'm understand to, what the question yeah. was. So, I have to come back and just to say that um, to the first point uh, about the resources. I'm not going to rehearse the differences of opinion that we have about the munificence or otherwise of the UK government. But what I would say is whatever the resources that you have, uh, governments of whichever colour then have to attach a priority. We've attached a priority to the fact that uh, if you're a constable, you'll get £5,000 more if you start in Scotland, or every rank in the police up to assistant chief constable will get more. So that's a priority we've attached to that. 
Um, however, the decision on equipment and operational requirements is for the Chief Constable. I'm not running away from the fact that, of course, he will have to live within a financial envelope, which we've discussed previously. I do agree with the member about the benefits of body-worn cameras. So, for example, it may well be the case that if people have body-worn cameras, you can avoid potentially a huge public inquiry because there's a contested account of what actually happened, which might, might be potentially... Um, avoided if body-worn cameras can provide that level of evidence. So I, I don't doubt the benefits of body-worn cameras, but um, it, it was an Iron Bevan that said, politics is a language of priorities, and we have to decide on priorities, as does the Chief Constable. We have prioritised the pay and the conditions of our police officers because we think they're worth it. Beyond that, we do have unavoidable pressures, but it will be a decision ultimately for the Chief Constable. So much. In respect of the, the £2,000 per head, that's Scottish Government figures. These aren't open for debate or discussion unless you disagree with them. Uh, going back to the body-worn cameras, given the £20 million that the Scottish Government have set aside for constitutional matters next year, and now that that's not likely to happen given the ruling in the court today, could that money not be used for body-worn cameras? Well, I, I would say that the option of getting out from underneath a Westminster at an utterly incompetent uh, Westminster government, which has presided over record inflation, a national debt that sits at £1.5 trillion. Compare that to a country of Scotland size, Norway, with a, a, an oil fund of over a trillion pounds in it. Uh, the record levels of taxation, which they took. Uh, no, no, you, you asked a question about the UK government, so I'm saying the incompetence that they have presided over, whether it's tax, inflation, public debt the opportunity to have a different way of doing these things in a much more sensible, mature way than, for example, the quasi-quartang budget is a very valuable option for the people of Scotland. Uh, and, of course, we want to fulfil our manifesto promise, which was to offer that referendum. OK, can you answer the question, please? I, I, I think the Cabinet Secretary yeah. has answered your question. And in the spirit of moving things on, I'm going to bring in Jamie Green. Thank you. Uh, uh, just... It's interesting you say that these are operational matters for the police. Um, Deputy Chief Constable Will Kerr told the SPA in a meeting a couple of weeks ago that he was, quote, professionally embarrassed by the slow rollout of cameras. He described mm -hmm. them as a very basic bit of kit. So it doesn't sound like these are nice add-ons. It sounds like they're must-haves. So I'd ask the Cabinet Secretary to reflect on his own comments on that. Speaking of incompetence, over the last couple of years, uh, we've learned through a Freedom of Information request that Nearly two million calls to the 101 service have gone unanswered or not answered by operators or hung up by the caller. We had a very frank and robust discussion about the state of 101 in this committee and evidence was given to us. Is the Cabinet Secretary content and happy that that service is working well to its full extent and can he commit that it will uh, remain in operation for the foreseeable? Uh, yes, I, I think it, it will remain in operation. Um, and no, of course, I'm not happy where there's been a service uh, failure there. Um, and those have been well publicised, and I've raised them with both the SPA uh, and with the Chief Constable when they've happened. Um, however, I do think that the, the model they now use, the CAM model, is one which is, uh, if it's, when it's used properly, is very effective. And also, that's probably borne out by the fact that I think I'm right in saying in Scotland that the number of calls answered within 10 seconds is around 10 per cent higher than it is elsewhere in the UK, but it shouldn't be the only bar. We have to make sure. I think currently it sits around 79 per cent. It has to be higher than that, and we'd acknowledge that. Uh, sorry, 79.9 per cent of calls answered in under 10 seconds compared to 68.3 per cent for the rest of the UK. And the rest of the UK is a useful comparison because, of course, many of the same pressures uh, will apply in relation to that. We did have the um, Inspectorate's Assurance Review into the uh, Contact Assessment Model CAM for call handling, and it, it identifies issues. I don't deny that, but it also identifies a number of uh, real successes. So we welcome the Police Scotland's plans to introduce the new digital contact platform, which will help strengthen both the 101 and the 999 services. Uh, once again, these are operational matters for the Chief Constable, and oversight of them is provided by the Scottish Police Authority. But if it's all going so swimmingly, why, why are people hanging up? Is it simply that they're waiting too long? Is it that, uh, that the calls are not being answered? Is it a lack of resource in the call centre? Is it something, anything to do with the centralisation of the service? I mean, what, what's the government doing to get underneath the root of the problem here? Because clearly, uh, so many calls 
uh, I mean, people don't phone for the sake of it. They clearly are calling because there's an issue. And often people are unsure where they should be calling uh, 101 or, or 999, where we're trying to alleviate pressure on 999. Clearly, that's the point of the service. Um, but, but people aren't phoning for the fun of it. But if they're hanging up, they're simply not getting through to somebody. That clearly is a matter of concern. And we all know the very grave repercussions of when call handling goes wrong. Uh, we've had that debate in the Parliament many times. So what exactly has the government done to undertake why so many calls are not being answered on the service and what exactly has been done to improve it? Because just the broad commitment that it will get better probably isn't good enough. We'll just say that, first of all, yes, I do acknowledge the fact that if somebody's call goes unanswered, then that's a failure of service at that point. I'm not wishing that away. The point I'm making, though, and it's not me saying this, is the Home Office that are saying this. So for July uh, this year, uh, Police Scotland, well above average, 80%, 79.9% calls answered in under 10 seconds. Now, I'm not saying that is, I've not used the word swimmingly, but I think that is uh, an example of, notwithstanding the pressures, Police Scotland are performing better than average. I think also, though, to get un under some of the issues in your, your point, is that Police Scotland, as I've said before, have been the first point of call for many things which are not Police Scotland's responsibility, and that's reflected in these calls. So we've looked at the nature of the calls. Some of them should be being directed towards other services, and we're trying to make sure we can do that. And it goes back to the point I made previously about increasing the reform that's necessary in terms of call handling and better liaison between the police, the emergency blue light services and other services. If they can alleviate that pressure on the calls by making sure the calls are directed into the right place in the first place, that will obviously help improve what is already an above average performance such that we can drive out any of those unanswered calls. So it is better than average just now. It's got to be better and work is continuing uh, to make sure it's better. The reason they're calling the police is because they're desperate. You know, they're phoning for an ambulance and they've been told to wait hours, so they're phoning the police to take them to the hospital. They're phoning the police because they're phoning local authority social work departments and they're closed out of hours. They're phoning the police because other public services are letting them down. And that's why people are calling 101 when they shouldn't be, because they are desperate and the police are the first and last point of contact. We've heard that evidence from numerous officers and the SPA and the SPF themselves, that the police have become this catch-all service, which is simply adding to the pressures uh, and that's directly down to a failure to deliver other vital public services that people need in an emergency situation. So, I mean, what conversations are you having with your colleagues in the Cabinet about relieving those pressures on the police? Uh, discussions with colleagues in the Cabinet about public services will often centre the fact that uh, after 12 years of austerity, we think there should be more money invested in public services. I acknowledge that. We should be investing more money in public services. But... Almost uniquely, the UK government has decided on a programme of austerity, which has now lasted for 12 years. The UK government, I'm asking you about your operational decisions, about how you manage government and how you and your colleagues manage public services. I know you're keen to divert to England and Wales, but I'm not. This is the Scottish Parliament, the Scottish Committee, and you're the Cabinet Secretary for Justice in Scotland. So if we could keep to the focus of the budget, that would be great. If it's possible to answer without being interrupted, I'll try and answer your question, which is to say the idea that you can talk sensibly about public services and try and exclude from consideration the financing which currently we have to rely on from the UK government I think is not honest. I think we have to acknowledge that is the main driver. I think most other people in the country realise we've had 12 years of austerity, suppressed budgets for public services, and I don't deny that's had an impact. Uh, I've mentioned the fact that we are trying to look at this so we can alleviate the pressure on the police so that calls can go to the right place in the first place so that reduces the number and the volume of calls which come in. But despite that, and notwithstanding those pressures, we still have a situation where Police Scotland are above the average, notwithstanding these pressures which apply across the whole of the UK. Thank you. OK, thanks very much. Um, I'm just watching the clock. We've got about 15, 20 minutes left, and I know there are some members who would like to come in with some other issues, um, one of them being Scottish Fire and Rescue. I'm going to come back to Jamie. Would you like to open up some No, I'll let others come in. I've had a okay. good one. Thank you. In that case, Russell Finley, you want to ask fire questions rescue. about Fire and Rescue? Yes, thank you, indeed. Um, so we've 11 fire stations don't have water supply. Over 100 fire stations have no rest or canteen facilities. Over 150 don't have sufficient showering facilities. 100 don't have minimum toilet provision. 125 don't have dedicated locker rooms. Over 100 don't have dedicated drying facilities. 282 don't have dignified changing areas. And no fire stations have a first aid room or space for nursing. 
mothers. Now, this Cabinet Secretary has got absolutely nothing to do with inflation, Brexit or the UK Government. According to the Interim Chief Officer, the evidence he gave to the Committee, that uh, £482 million has been reduced from the cost base of the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service over the past 10 years. That is uh, due entirely to the money provided to the fire service from the Scottish Government. Can you uh, address those concerns and the concerns of firefighters about these extremely poor facilities? First of all, I think it is uh, true to state that, of course, the fire service has got to uh, comply with stringent safety requirements, um, and there is no suggestion uh, from um, the SFRS that the equipment is unsafe. I hate to correct the member, but I think the backlog that he talked about was 492 rather than 482, according to the SFRS. Um, but we acknowledge, of course, the challenges. I think the desperate attempt to try and pretend this has nothing to do with settlements from the UK government, I just think, doesn't register with people out there. They know what the situation is. They know what austerity has meant over the last 12 years. They know, both in terms of resource and in terms of backlog, uh, capital backlog. We, uh, there is no backlog in terms of the maintenance uh, side of things, but yes, investment in um, the estate structure. There have been reviews previously, uh, and that is being reviewed again just now. I think it is also true to say that many of the fire stations were built in a previous era, uh, era to provide fire cover for industries and housing, which are no longer there in some cases. So that is an opportunity to review the estate and to make savings through the rationalisation of that estate which in turn should allow additional investment to be made in the remaining fire stations. The SFRS, you may have heard in your evidence from them, uh, have developed a detailed community risk index model which identifies the risks based in individual communities across Scotland, and that enables them to take decisions on the resources in an evidence-based way. So we will continue to work through these issues with the SFRS, not least through the budget process, which I have mentioned previously. I'm going to bring in Rona Mackay now. I think you've got some questions around gender-based abuse. Yes, it's relating to the court and prosecution yeah. services. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, convener. Um, just before I, I ask my question, I think it's interesting to note that the Conservative members on the committee are asking overtly political questions. And when the Cabinet Secretary responds with straightforward and honest answers, they don't like it. Um, and I think it's important to note that. Um, so... Yeah, I'm, I'm interested to know, you, you touched on it in your, your opening statement, Cabinet Secretary, the, the priority um, that funding will be given to, the, to Lady Dorian's review uh, and the prosecution of rape and sex offences and the work of, of uh, you know, the COPS COVID unit. But first of all, um, Lady Dorian's review and, um, you know, if budget implications will affect that or not, it's just, just to clarify that. Thanks. Yeah, and the member will know that we have to go through a process before starting the bill process to make sure there's financial cover for the implications. And there are, as you rightly say, substantial implications. So um, in terms of a victim's commissioner, um, that is obviously one of those. In terms uh, of specialist courts, if that's what's agreed, there'll be a cost associated with that as well. And a number of other recommendations will inevitably have costs associated with them. But we have gone through the process to make sure we have financial cover. It doesn't mean that there's not still a challenge to make sure we have those finances. Uh, but yes, that's been taken into account. And there is substantial progress being made on Lady Dorian's uh, recommendations, both the ones which require legislation, some of which I've mentioned, and some which don't. That's good to know that it's still very much on track. Yeah. And with regard to um, you know, court backlogs and the effect on domestic abuse victims, um, I understand this will take priority when it comes to, 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 to trying to clear the, the backlog and the specific nature of these cases will, will take priority. Yeah, and, and, my, and my colleague Neil could maybe say more about the figures here, but the extent to which that's been a priority right through the pandemic is very evident if you look at the balance of cases going through. And just to clarify, I have mentioned the success in terms of um, summary courts, 12,000 reduction, uh, down from 44,000 to 31, obviously more or less. Um, so that's proceeding very well. What we're not seeing is the same level of progression at least to solemn courts. And so there's now a change being made by the court service to make sure we switch resources to help affect a, a, a similar reduction in relation to the solemn side of things, some of which may include some of the cases that you're talking about, but it might be worth hearing from Neil in relation to domestic abuse. 
Yeah, I think the Cabinet Secretary has uh, covered it really well. The court service have been publishing regular monthly statistics on uh, throughout the COVID period on the, the scale of cases and the progress, and that's um, it, you know, the, the updates on that have confirmed the priority given to domestic abuse cases throughout the COVID period, you know, despite the, the challenges and pressures of, of that, and that's continuing through just now. As the Cabinet Secretary says, in terms of the, the High Court in particular, a very high proportion of those cases will be uh, sexual offences cases or the most serious end of domestic abuse cases. And again, the, the court service announced last week the intention to establish two new high courts and uh, six new uh, sheriff and jury courts, although spread across uh, a number of locations, to try and uh, speed up that process around dealing with the backlog in the solemn cases. That's really encouraging to know. Thank you. Thanks, Convener. Thank you. Much indeed. Are there any other members who would like to come in on this specific topic? No? Okay. Um, okay. In that case, then, I'm just going to bring uh, the session to a close. I'm just wanting to finish off, though. Sorry, I thought you said we have questions on that subject. There are other questions. If okay, we have time. that's fine. Okay, I'll bring in Jamie, then Russell, and then I'll finish with a Thank you. A, um, a just just to move question. to a, a completely different area. It's an area that I don't think we've really touched a lot on, but I think it deserves some airtime. That's the issue of community justice and the effect of the budget on that. There were a, a quite a large number of submissions, although it did, didn't feature as highly in our oral evidence sessions, given the prominence that police, fire and courts and prisons obviously generally has. But I think the issue of community justice and social uh, work uh, delivery uh, at a local authority level is something that we perhaps don't spend enough time on as a committee, so I wonder if we could maybe ask some questions about that. Um, the, 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 obviously, unsurprisingly, the evidence that we did receive was, was, was that of warnings that any real terms um, uh, budget forecast for those organisations, particularly from uh, uh, COSLA um, and from uh, Community Justice Scotland uh, themselves and Social Work Scotland, about the effect that that would have on their ability to deliver adequate and robust and fair uh, community justice services uh, would be uh, um, put at risk, uh, to, be, to be quite frank. Um, what does the Cabinet Secretary think could be done to ensure that local authorities um, and anyone in the voluntary or paid justice sector uh, are able to carry out their functions in that, in, you know, given the tight forecast that we're looking at? Yeah, I think going back to the previous back and forward about budgets. I think at least if we can acknowledge this is a different budget environment from last year. So last year, um, in that different context, we awarded an additional £50 million pounds for the reasons that you mentioned. Um, we are aware that the disposals uh, are not... Um, there's not the same confidence across the country from different courts uh, in relation to those disposals. So that additional £50 million, pounds, which was in addition to, I think, £119 million pounds of continuing funding, was to try and affect that change so that the courts would have confidence, wherever they were in Scotland, that a community disposal would be effective and it would be properly monitored. So that just gives our intention a direction of travel. But you're right to say... We are now looking at a different budget environment and we have to consider that against other options. I would say, though, that in relation to the bail and release bill, this is a fundamental part of it. It will not work if we don't have proper community um, justice disposals. So that is our intention. Um, we do have budget pressures to consider as we go forward. And we hear what the sector said. We've had discussions. There's a new national plan for community justice that's just come out as well, which is seeking to do this. Um, and also, I think I would say that the additional monies that we provided in the current year were done, I think, in a very um, sensitive way, such that those authorities, those local authorities, had been very uh, well served by their community justice infrastructure, weren't punished by money just going to those that weren't, because it's like punishing success. So we've managed to provide money to those authorities that need to really uh, invest more and to uh, uh, produce more money for the other authorities. So that is the intention, but it is one of those things that's going to have to be decided as a priority in the budget process. And the reason I mention it is because if it becomes apparent and clear that, the, 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 if you like, the political direction travel is to send less people to prison and offer alternatives, then surely that relies solely on the adequacy of what those alternatives look like and that there is not just public faith but judiciary faith and confidence. And we've heard from sheriffs and judges who, who feel like they're not trusting that those sentences will either be carried out or delivered properly. 
um, and therefore that leaves them with little alternative. So we can't simply divert people from prison if there's nothing to divert them to specifically, otherwise we will absolutely will lose public confidence in the service. So is that something that you're mindful of also? Very much, and I, I don't deny the logic of that. I think there's also, in relation to um, electronic monitoring and some other aspects, there's a need for more information to be provided to the judiciary. Uh, sometimes there's not the level of awareness that there should be. I'm not saying it's their fault, and it's not for me by any means to educate the judiciary, but I do think there's a need for more awareness about what is possible. But you're right, at the root of it, they have to have confidence that that's a legitimate disposal for them. Uh, it won't be a political direction not to send people to prison. Of course, that will be for the judiciary. But I don't dispute the logic the member uh, draws out. And that is our direction of travel. That's what we believe in. That underpins the ideas behind some of the legislation we're taking through. The issue is how we can make sure we continue to do that with the resources available. Thank, thank you for letting me in. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to bring in Russell Finlay. Um, Cabinet Secretary, your government has written what is effectively a blank cheque to cover the cost of the Rangers' malicious prosecution scandal. They tell us the amount has now reached £51 million, which incidentally is double the amount it would give cost to give every police officer in Scotland body-worn cameras. I'd like to ask if you can give us any idea as to where the total amount might end up and also ask who you think is responsible for this and whether there will be any consequences for this absolutely shocking state of affairs. I don't think I have anything to add to the previous uh, responses given by the First Minister, except to reiterate the point that the cost of that, and I can't tell you what the uh, ultimate cost will be, it depends on factors out with my control, it obviously predates my time in office, but the cost of that will not fall on the justice um, portfolio directly, that will be borne across the whole of government. I don't think, um, certainly my colleagues were in post at the time that that was um, more of an, um, when that became a live issue, I don't think then to add, but it's not something I think I can add more to than what the First Minister said previously. Do you, do, you think, do, you, do you think people will be surprised, though, that £51 million has been paid out through to incompetence or wrongdoing and no one's been held to account? Uh, well, I think you know the processes for accountability which are in train and I have nothing to add to that. OK. Pauline McNeill, I think you want to bring in, come in on that. I, I didn't know this issue was going to be raised, but anyway, it has been raised... Um, I appreciate Cabinet Secretary. At the moment, everyone's effectively can't say anything about this case because it's a live issue, so I'm you know, not going to press you on that. And, but Russell Finlay is right about accountability. A Lord Advocate took a decision some years ago that has massively impacted on the credibility of the Crown Office, and um, no, not to mention the huge sums of money. I mean, I'm bound to ask, what scope have you got as Cabinet Secretary when everything's settled? If you satisfy yourself <laughs> that there's going to be accountability, or at least I hope you'd agree with me, that somebody has to hold the Crown Office to account for that decision, because a person took that decision, a former Lord Advocate took this decision, and I don't think it can just be allowed to just dwindle out once the court case is finished. I think... This cannot be allowed to happen again, surely. Uh, all I would say is I think I understand the point the member is making, but the pen member also started her comments by saying that I, she knows I can't comment on some of these yeah. things. We're also talking about uh, whatever else it was. It was a, take a, a decision taken by an independent uh, Crown Office, um, so she knows the constraints under what I can say, but she will also know the process for accountability that's in train for this. Um, in terms of uh, a subsequent inquiry. So I, um, if that's the case, then that will also be independent. So that's the reason why I uh, am not able to say more at this stage. Um, so, so, so it's the inquiry that's going to hold the decision-making of current office to account over this decision? Is that... Well, yeah. I think some people would uh, term that as a, a process of... A, if it's a public inquiry, that is a, a if, process of accountability. If, sorry. I just want to be clear, is there going to be one, did you say? Well, I think we've, that's been established oh. in the responses yeah. by the First Minister in the Chamber a number of occasions. Yeah. Okay. OK, thanks very much. Thanks, Cabinet Secretary. I wonder if I can... I'm just going to bring things to a close, but I'd just like to go um, back to the 
uh, emergency budget re review, review. Just with a quick question in relation to the UK-wide emergency services mobile communication programme. Um, so obviously, um, the most recent update um, from the review was that the Scottish Government will cut 14.2 million um, from uh, a projected saving uh, on the Scottish Government contribution towards the, um, the, the programme. So I just wondered if you can expand a little bit on what, um, what is being reduced and what impact that this, this may have on Police Scotland, um, Scottish Fire and Rescue, uh, and is the rollout of the new radio systems for police officers, will, will that be affected at all? I'll maybe ask uh, Don if I can to come in uh, after making a couple of comments, which is this, this project, it's a bit like high speed rail. It's been going on for many, many years. Um, I remember because, as I said, I was involved in the Joint Police Board, the rollout of Airwave, and that was complicated. Um, uh, but I have many concerns over this project, which I've registered with the UK government. The Welsh government has registered concerns. Um, and uh, the budget changes over time. Uh, the spend doesn't match the profiles that we expect. So that's the basic underlying situation, but Don's very heavily involved in this, and I'm sure he enjoys being very heavily involved in it as well. Yeah, so the, the change in the emergency budget review is very simple. Um, the UK government, the Home Office, gives us projections at the start of the year as to how much our share of the spending on the UK programme will be for that year. They update those projections at various points through the year. Um, they updated those projections for Scotland to reduce our contribution this year by, um, I think it was around £10 million. Um, we've also agreed with them to switch some capital to revenue, which represents the, the balance then that was announced in the emergency budget review. Um, so it's, it's, it's largely about the pace of progress and pace of spend on the UK programme and what that means for our share of the contribution to the bills that the, that the programme pays. Th thanks very much. Is there any sort of indication around timescales? I mean, I'm not wanting to stray off budget, but that obviously does correlate with budget, as you've just said. Yeah, um, I mean, the, the, the programme regularly updates its, its programme deployment dates. I, I'll, I'll, I'll check the latest deployment date for Scotland and, and can confirm that. Um, as, as the Cabinet Secretary has said, you know, one of our key concerns is that that date has changed um, on a regular basis, that the deployment um, date for the system has changed and been significantly delayed over a number of years. Um, and one of the things I would say is that what we are looking for from the programme, and I, I know the Cabinet Secretary as well, is actually for them to commit to dates that they can stick to and that they will keep to and that the police can have faith and, and the other emergency services can have faith and have trust in that those dates will actually be delivered. So that's the, that's the dialogue that goes on between us and the programme on a, a very regular basis, convener. Thanks. So can we take it from that then that ultimately the rollout won't be affected, although there's a lot of questions, but ultimately it wouldn't be affected? Um, so... Um, uh, I, the, the programme has not changed its deployment dates. Um, that does not mean... The history of the project is that that does not mean they will not be subject to review at some point in the future, I'm afraid, convener. OK, th thanks very much indeed. OK, thank you very much. I'm going to bring this session to a close. Can I thank you, Cabinet Secretary, and your officials for attending this morning? Uh, and, as usual, if there are any... Uh, follow-up questions that members have, we'll uh, pick those up in writing. So we'll just have a very short suspension to allow uh, for a change of officials. Thanks very much.
Thank you very much. So our next uh, item of business this morning is to consider an affirmative statutory instrument, which is the International Organisations, Immunities and Privileges Scotland Amendment Order of 2022. And I refer members to paper three. I welcome back Keith Brown, Cabinet Secretary for Justice and Veterans, to the meeting. And I also welcome his officials, uh, Walter Drummond Murray, Head of Civil Courts, Inquiries, Private and International Law, and Emma Thompson, Legal, Director, Legal Directorate with the Scottish Government. So welcome. So I'd like to open up by inviting the Cabinet Secretary to make a short statement on the SSI. Yeah, thanks, Convener. I have. Uh chopped some of the commentary I was going to make because I know we've had a long morning and I think this uh, SSI is not dissimilar to ones which this committee or its predecessors have considered in the past. Uh, the draft International Organisations Immunities and Privileges Scotland Amendment Order 2022 confers various legal immunities and privileges upon the Inter-American Investment Corporation IIC and on persons associated with that organisation so far as that is within the devolved competence of this parliament. The order is limited to the, use, the issue of privileges and immunities, but just by way of background, I would mention that the IIC is the main private sector arm of the Inter-American Development Bank Group, the IDB, which lends to governments and to the IIC. The UK has opted to join the IIC, and the conferral of immunities and privileges to the IIC is required to ensure that the UK can fully comply. Uh, with its obligations under Article 7 of the IIC's founding agreement. And joining the IIC offers the opportunity to be part of an important organisation in the Latin America and Caribbean region, which will support economic growth and leverage uh, further private sector resources for development financing. And just in order to assist the committee, I'll say a little about the nature of the privileges and immunities involved. The conferral of legal capacity and privileges and immunities is necessary to ensure that the IIC can function as an international organisation in the UK. The order grants the IIC immunity from suit and legal process, inviolability of archives and premises and exemption from taxation. It also grants personal privileges to the IIC's officers and employees, immunity from legal process with respect to official acts uh, and exemption from income tax. The income tax exemption does not apply to British uh, citizens. The privileges and immunities conferred by the draft order are granted primarily on the basis of strict functional need. They are no greater in extent than those required to enable the IEC to function effectively. Uh, so that the privileges and immunities uh, are conferred in accordance with the agreement, the UK Government have introduced a statutory instrument through affirmative procedure with the expectation that the order will come into force late this year or early next year. Uh, the UK Government also laid their SI in Parliament on the 11th of October. Uh, so I welcome the opportunity to hear members' views uh, on the order and I would commend it to the committee. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. So I'll just open it up to questions from members. Jamie. Thank you. Uh, apologies, I haven't been on this committee when this sort of thing has uh, risen in the past, so um, I'm new to the subject matter. But I just had a simple question. That's if the Cabinet Secretary is aware of if the organisation has any employees, officers or undertakes any activities in Scotland. The reason I asked is on the last point about um, uh, specifically around income taxation. If an employee of the organisation was ordinarily resident in Scotland, would they pay uh, taxation that was... A, appropriate to south of the border or whether they would pay locally devolved income taxation, which may differ? My understanding is the tax liabilities are termed a reserved UK income tax. Uh, I'm not sure if that applies to the person, uh, person to the employees. There is no current plan to have employees based in this country. It will be visiting employees and they have no offices, as I understand it, in Scotland and the UK. But just to check, I've got those facts right, if I can ask either one to come in. Well, I'll certainly take the second point, which is that in this case, um, the order is largely theoretical because it's not expected that they will have activities in Scotland. Um, I don't know if Emma can confirm on the taxation point. Uh, so um, they, they're exempt from devolved taxes in Scotland, but as I say, it's a, a theoretical um, point at the moment because they're, it's unlikely um, to, be, to be a base in Scotland. It's going to be visiting employees. Fine. Thank you. I just wanted to check. Uh, any other questions from members? No? Okay, thank you very much. In that case, we'll just move straight on to the next agenda item. 
and I invite the Cabinet Secretary to move the motion in his name, uh, number 06291, that the Criminal Justice Committee recommends that the International Organisation's Immunities and Privileges Scotland Amendment Order of 2022 be approved. Thank you very much. So the question is that motion 06291 in the name of Keith Brown be agreed. Are we all agreed? agreed. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Cabinet Secretary uh, and your officials for attending. Uh, and that concludes our consideration of the SSI. And we'll just suspend the meeting briefly to allow for a change of witnesses. Thank you. Thank you very much. So our next item of business today is to take evidence as part of our scrutiny of the National Care Service Bill and specifically those provisions relating to criminal justice, social work and community justice. And I refer members to papers four and five. So we have apologies this morning from Claire Wilson, who's unfortunately unable to join us. But I welcome to the meeting Lindsay Smith. Uh, Chair of the Justice Standing Committee of Social Work Scotland. And we have joining us online uh, Anil Gupta, Chief Officer for Communities with COSLA, and Kate Ramsden, National Executive Member of Unison Scotland. So a warm welcome to you all. So we have a number of questions that we would like to ask you. Um, given that we have two members uh, online, I, I would just ask members if you can just indicate who you would like to direct your question to. And if I can ask our uh, witnesses who are joining us online, if you would like to come in, if you can just indicate uh, accordingly on the chat uh, function. So we'll now just move um, straight to questions. And I'll just start with a very general uh, opening question. I'll maybe come to yourself, Lindsay, uh, and then I'll bring in Kate uh, and Daniel. So it's really just to um, ask for your sort of general views uh, on the possibility of justice social work being uh, included within uh, the planned uh, National Care Service. Um, how, how might this uh, affect uh, criminal justice social work uh, and the services there that are being provided currently, in what way uh, would you see those uh, changing? So I'll come to you first, Lindsay. Um, thank you and hello, everyone. So um, it it's feels like a, quite a, an abstract question because of the, the detail is not in front of us. Um, I think um, if we work on some assumptions, I think there is a potential um, for it to improve um, some some things that um, that are, are currently needing to, to be looked at, but I think we, we do need further evidence to, to make those calls. I think um, so. We work on the assumption that um, justice social work would would move from having thirty two 
local authorities to one um, joint point of accountability and um, rather than the multiple arrangements which are in place at the moment, um, you, we have um, identified that um, you, you know, that structure has been cumbersome in, um, in the past. So there is an assumption that if you were to streamline it and have you, you know, one point of contact with one set of governance arrangements, um, that some of the barriers to developing and scaling up improvements and, and services um, would be reduced. I think um, there is an also, also an assumption that if justice social work um, were to be included in the NCS, that we would be doing so alongside our colleagues, which uh, is ultimately a, a positive, the strength in the profession remaining together for the good of the profession itself, but also for, for those people that of, of Scotland who use social work services. Um, you, you'll be well aware in the, the committee that a, someone who's involved, a person who's involved in the justice system has often multiple and complex needs. So um, social work, um, work across adult services, addictions, children and families to coordinate services um, around that person. So. Um, it, one of the proposals um, uh, uh, for the NCS that, that seems to be taking shape is the creation of a national social work agency. Um, and again, you know, making some assumptions that, that the impact of that could be positive in, in relation to dealing with some of our issues around about recruitment um, and training for staff. Um, we, it often feels as if we're a, a national profession at the moment with, without a national structure, um, which certainly um, impacts on our ability to workforce plan. So, so some positives, but there, there's, there's some, um, there's some I, I would say, concerns or, or, or negative aspects to it at this point. But I'll let colleagues come in. OK, th thanks very much, Lindsay. Um, I'll bring in Kate. I'll come to you first, Kate, and then I'll bring in... Um, our other witness. So, Kate. Yeah, I think from a unison perspective, it would be fair to say that we are deeply concerned about this bill and the impact it's going to have on social work, criminal justice, social work and wider social work. The trouble really for us is that there's no detail um, about what social work would look like if this went ahead. Um, it leaves the bill, if passed, we'd leave all of that open to ministers to bring forward secondary legislation. And if passed, it'll leave our social work um, and social care members as well a hostage to fortune, really, as to what their service will look like, who their employer will be, and how services will be managed and will be funded. Um, and we're really concerned that that impedes proper scrutiny and risks... Um, it risks um, weakening parliamentary democracy. Um, there's promises in the bill that they will consult before transfer, but that consultation is entirely non-binding um, on the government, and they can completely ignore it, which is what they've done with the many, many criticisms that have been about this bill, not just from us, but from other agencies as well. Um, we think that this has been done the wrong way around. We really believe that they should have started off um, engaging with all the people who are involved in this, social workers, social work clients, communities, um, and built a national care service from the bottom up. Um, we think that what this does really is creates massive uncertainty for our social work members in criminal justice, because they've no idea what it will look like. Um, as things move forward. Um, and, you know, we already have a social work service in crisis. Um, so this kind of upheaval and uncertainty can only make matters worse. I think it was um, Social Work Scotland themselves that said that one in four of our social work students who graduate won't make more than six years in the job. And we know from our own surveys that more and more social workers are looking to take early retirement. We think that this will only make things worse. So we would really ask the Scottish Government and ask yourself to put pressure on them to go back to the drawing board and, and look at it again and really co-design properly. Th th thanks very much, Kate. Um, I'll now just bring Anil straight in. Anil, would you like to pick that up? Thank you very much. Um, I think much of what my colleagues have uh, just said are 
um, very broadly supported by Osler's position as the representative body of Scottish local government. Um, perhaps it's worthwhile just saying the justice, social work and community justice areas are facing huge challenges at this very moment in time. So, for instance, uh, the investment at the moment, the cost of delivering the services um, are extremely problematic. The flat cash settlement, for instance, is um, likely to result in around a 7% cut in the monies available for this area of activity. Um, and obviously, given the theoretical nature of what's actually been presented to us, the issues around finance uh, of the sector are just not covered in any way. Um, we have been through quite considerable changes over the last um, few years. 2005 saw the creation of community justice authorities. Uh, 2015 was the legislation which convened the Community Justice Partnerships and Community Justice Scotland. And if this is to go ahead, we'll see another significant change within a shortish period of time when what we're looking for is a degree of stability and innovation in the area, as well as um, getting into the real detail about what this actually costs to be done properly. Um, the particular uh, draft legislation doesn't cover in any way satisfactorily the multi-agency work that local government is responsible for in terms of community justice and where that would end up. We will still have matters around housing still with employability, issues of um, uh, education skills and so forth to, to, to bring to the table, uh, but we probably won't have the, re, um, the, the services that uh, help complete the picture um, should the, these be taken out of local government. Um, I think what we see with the lack of definition is um, a very um, un unclear proposition, and it's quite difficult to do on the work. I think in the papers that you have, uh, the Scottish Government has listed the research work that we're looking at, which is about how best to um, look at what would be appropriate for justice social work into the future. Um, unfortunately, uh, we just don't know uh, enough about what the proposition is to be able to do that work properly. And obviously, the other point is that um, this is doing this, the uh, work probably the wrong way around, where we should be looking at the strengths and weaknesses of the current systems and what is needed to make them deliver into the future. Uh, and then perhaps discuss matters about where these are positioned and what is needed. Clearly, there's no opposition whatsoever to the idea of developing standards across the country. but being able to deliver on standards does require an element of local diversity to meet the local circumstances. Um, and I think without that, uh, you might actually end up hobbling the system, not only with the disruption, disruption sorry, and elements of planning blight in the area, but you also probably dampen down innovation that's already there. So um, our obvious other concern is one which has been referenced by the Unison Rep about parliamentary scrutiny and uh, pushing um, the real important issues, including the finances and the detail, into secondary legislation would not give you a huge amount of opportunity to question what is being presented to you in the longer term. And clearly, although we have perfectly good relationships over community and criminal justice with the Scottish Government, it feels uh, undemocratic to leave the decisions ultimately or what are shared competences at the moment to a minister to, to decide on how to go forward. Thank you. Th th thanks very much, um, Anil. Um, I'm going to just come back with, uh, I'll come back to Lindsay with just a, a, a follow-up question and, uh, and then I'll come back to Kate and Anil uh, and then I'll open it up to members. Um, obviously, and I think you've all um, alluded to the fact that um, there is uh, a, a bit of work to be done in terms of a big piece of work around uh, co-design and really understanding what, what 
this proposal uh, will, will look like. Um, and in the context of criminal justice social work, uh, the proposed plan uh, is that there is a consultation around that. I, I just wondered if I can come back to you all and just ask for your, um, your commentary on what you would like to see that consultation process um, focus on uh, and what you would like to see um, come out of that consultation process and around priorities for how criminal justice social work uh, continues um, to deliver the best service possible. So, Lindsay, I'll come to you first. Um, so, so, we really welcome the opportunity to have these types of conversation. Um, I think there is, um, from a Social Work Scotland point of view, and if I can speak for the, the members of the committee, um, there's a real recognition that the status quo cannot continue and that we do welcome an opportunity to, to review Justice Social Works um, position, its current model and, and, and what might be improved. Um, so, I, so that there is a real appetite for change and reform. Um, I, I absolutely take on board the, the points made by colleagues around about, you know, we have we have a really um, weary staff group, and there is a question about whether this um, scale of change is, is is appropriate at this time, um, given what folk have been through and, and have been dealing with. But I, I would hope that the research would would set out the strengths and the weaknesses in, in the current system. I think. Um, we, we would want to um, work out what the benefits might be um, to justice social work being included um, in the NCS in relation to leadership, which I, I think um, we, we've touched upon structures in itself do not seek the change that we're looking for. There's a whole collective um, that, that, that needs to be looked at and leadership professional development, so that's leading, leading into that, that kind of um, opportunities for the staff group as a whole, um, the, the pain conditions um, that, that Eunice have touched upon, and, and most importantly, the, the outcome for service users. The, the Feely report for me um, obviously didn't, didn't consider justice social work as part of that. Um, I, it, it was really a, and it, it, the right thing to do. It, it listened to people who use services um, and their voices were really prominent in the report, but there was no justice voices in there. And I think part of the, the, res the research needs to include that voice. Um, so. Lindsay, um, I'll come to Kate and then Anil. Kate. Um, yeah. I, th I mean, we consulted with our members in kind of across social work about the National Care Service Bill, and I think there's a real unhappiness that they weren't consulted before this came out. Um, there's a real sense that, that there hasn't been any opportunity to look at what the role of social work is, what the important role of criminal justice social work is, to look at the kind of professional values that underpin that role. And I think all that needs to look at, but I would again say it shouldn't be looked at after the bill has been passed. It should be looked at before the bill goes through Parliament, because if we don't do that, then we can have no confidence that those those voices will be listened to and heard, and the voices of service users, etc., as well. Um, I mean, even issues like pensions haven't been looked at. So we have a whole um, group of social work members who don't know what will happen to their pensions if these things go ahead. So there's been a whole lot of work that still needs to be done that's not been done, but it needs to be done, in our view, before the bill is passed, so that we can have confidence that that will all be taken account of within within the bill. Um, I just wanted to add just a small point in terms of um, the, the funding. Um, I wanted to say that there's absolutely nothing in the bill that addresses the current underfunding of social work, including criminal justice social work. It's, in fact, it's really sorely lacking in financial in financial information. And what information is there has been roundly rubbished by a number of people that have responded to the, the bill and also by the Finance Committee of the Scottish Government, um, who have been very critical about the lack of detail. So again, that's all things that need to be looked at and addressed, but they need to be done, in our opinion, and many others, before the bill is passed. 
because if they're not, then it just leaves us a hostage to fortune. Thanks very much, Kate. And Anil. Thank you. Um, I, I think one response could be that the consultation may be about the wrong subject at this time. I mean, we really do have to have a, a broad discussion about the future of community and criminal justice. And um, the issue about structural change at this stage um, is probably not the most important matter. It is about longer term investment. It is about um, the lack of confidence that we are told regularly that sentences have in community disposals and what needs to be done to um, improve the situation. Certainly, local government is uh, very keen to address issues around workforce, the finances, uh, the experimentation, the learning from elsewhere, standards, and so forth. Those will probably be touched on in a consultation in any case, but we really do need to uh, be looking more at uh, what is required to achieve the to achieve sustainable change rather than to hobble ourselves with complete change in structures at the moment. Um, the other thing that would probably be, I think, important for us is actually how you interpret the consultation. Uh, the last one was simply done, as far as we were concerned, as a numerical exercise about the number of votes uh, or views and which way those went on different subjects with little weighting attached to the people who were responsible for leading, working in, financing and so forth, the areas of work. It needs to be a bit more sophisticated so that the voice of locally elected members as well are given their due weighting as representatives of local communities rather than just being counted as ordinary simple participants who are representing individual views. Okay, th thanks very much, Anil. Um, I'm going to open it up to members now, and I think Fulton McGregor, you were wanting to come in first. Yeah, yeah thanks, Convener, and good morning to all the panel. And uh, for the purpose of this particular evidence session, I should uh, probably refer uh, members to uh, my register of interest as a, a registered social worker with the OSC. Um I mean, I, I think that this issue of um, integration in, in some form or another isn't, isn't anything new. Is, um, both committee members and the panelists will know. Um, and I think it is probably fair to say that um, the, the workforce as a whole probably wouldn't be overly um, happy about it, I, I don't think. But that's the, despite the point of whether it's a good thing or a bad thing. I agree with the comments that have been made so far. I think we need more information, and it does feel like um, in a bill the size of, it's the size of this, um, and I'm sure this is not the intention of the government. Um, I can, uh, uh, in fact, I can probably guarantee that. But it does feel a wee bit like this has been sort of added on to, and we'll deal with it later, sort of thing, um, which is probably not really a great place to be because we don't have enough information. So what I wanted to ask um, the uh, the, uh, the panelists is, what more can be done at this stage and future stages of the consultation to make sure that um, the the people who are working in the sector just now and people who use the services are having a, a chance to have their say in what they think the positives might be and the negatives might be to and how can you, yourselves and all your respective organisations make sure you get that information out to the people um, that, that, that are working there to get that um, to get that feedback you know to see how we can move forward collaboratively because I think you know as you said there is there is um, Lindsay you said you point out there probably is um, advantages to it. You know, you don't want to fragment the social work workforce. Um, if, if other aspects of social work are moving over, plus there's a lot of health overlap. However, at the same time, the same argument can be made if you take it out of local authorities and you lose the link with perhaps housing, stuff like that, which is very important as well. So you should almost take with one hand and uh, lose with another. So, uh, you know, the joint up working needs to work anyway, regardless of where it's situated, because there'll be jo uh, whether it's with local authorities or the new National Care Service. So I wonder if you can perhaps comment on that and how, how you can um, get the workforce to, to be involved and be engaged in this. Yes, and it's difficult. Um, so as, as well as my role within Social Work Scotland, I'm Head of Service for Justice Social Work in Glasgow. So we um, have been engaging staff around about this topic, which, which has been tough because we don't have the detail. Um, so again, repeating the point, it feels quite abstract at the moment. So um, when you're asking them to 
think through it and think through the pros and cons, it's difficult for them to do so um, because they don't have a lot of detail. One thing I would say in relation to that is we would want to consult the staff on the ground. We would want to hear from those who have lived experience and who have living experience within um, the justice system. That takes time. And, and what we're trying to achieve in, in relation to this research um, is, is, is we, we don't have a lot of time to play with, to, to really properly consult with, um, with service users, with um, staff, with um, <clears throat> key stakeholders, such as third sector, and you had um, touched upon, you know, the, the wider community. Um, so, um, so if, if you're asking what would make this um, a really meaningful piece of work, then proper consultation with, with the key stakeholders would be, would, would be key to that, and staff um, being one of those. Um, and uh, so, yes. Yeah, thanks a lot. And I turn to the other two uh, panellists, Kate and, uh, and Anil. Um, I, I suppose then, how could, you know, based on that, what, what could this committee ask of the government then in relation to that? Do uh, Would it be helpful... Um, for the government to provide more information on this, or are actually, you know, as organisations, are you quite happy just now that it's that it is more of an abstract concept and it would, and a full consultation would would happen later, or do you think actually that this particular aspect needs to be taken out the NCS bill just now and dealt with completely separately? Um, I don't know, it's a bit of devil's advocate questions here, but putting them out there. Yeah, I, if I can come in, there's um. Oh. Oh, I'm getting an echo. Sorry, I don't know why that is. Um, there's a, you've got a really good model for consultation in the Scottish Government. You did the independent care review that resulted in the promise, which actually took a bit of time to, to speak to every stakeholder, including the, you know, the people who use the service, to come up with the kind of um, changes that were needed. And I think that's what's needed for social work at the minute. It needs to be pulled right back and we need to be taking um, the views of everybody about what's good about criminal justice and other social work, what works well, what doesn't work so well, what needs to be changed. Because you're absolutely right, there's no such thing as a seamless service. It's just about how you manage the seams. And there are so many important um, local relationships that would be lost if um, if justice social work was taken out of communities. Um, there's so much local knowledge that would be lost. And actually, that isn't just about um, how they best provide the service to their service users. That's also about public protection, um, having that kind of local knowledge. So all of those things need to be taken into account. And we need to really be allowing social workers to talk about the purpose of their profession, the values that they, they want to work with, and how best they can be supported to do that in a way that genuinely makes offers the people they work with the opportunity for change, which is in everybody's best interest. So I think at the minute, it, it's the worst possible of all worlds, because we don't know enough. And yet, if the bill goes through, people know there will be change, but don't know what the change will look like. I do think it needs to be pulled right back to have a proper, um, to, to allow all stakeholders really to be properly engaged from the bottom up in what a service should look like and how that service should be delivered and managed and where the funding is going to come for that as well, because funding is a key issue that's just not being addressed at all. Just ask about one point there, um, Kate, you made, and maybe uh, rather than um, taking up too much time, and uh, uh, Anil could maybe refer to um, when he's responding. But you were saying there that folk will know there's change coming if this is passed. But uh, is that the case? Is that is that the feeling that, that, that people are getting? Because my understanding is that it just allows the Scottish government to consult with the possibility of change, but um, you know, it does there need to be some work there then done with the workforce and people who use the services to say it, you know, it's a possibility, but it's not, but you are quite definite there, Kate, because you were saying that folk will believe that once it passes that change is coming, um, rather than it being a possibility. 
I think that's absolutely right. People are really anxious about it because what it does is it then puts all the power in the hands of Scottish ministers. And although there's a, they say they will consult, and I think they believe to consult, what they do with that consultation is, is in the lap of the gods. And I don't think there's anybody that looks at that National Care Service Bill amongst our members that doesn't believe that change will happen, but doesn't feel that they know what that will look like or how they can engage with that. And that is why, you know, we're really strongly saying withdraw the bill, start again, do proper consultation, particularly around social work's involvement with it, which has not had any kind of consultation process at all. And um let's see what you know what the best way to deliver the services that meets the aspirations of our members and the Scottish Government. Thanks, Kate. Um, and service users. Is it convenient? Is it okay to bring Neil in, or am I taking up too much time? Is that right, yeah, Neil? Um, I think the consultation itself we need to recognise is going to happen after the research has been done, and one of the things that we've been pushing for is. Um, a strength, weakness, opportunities, threats approach to um, the situation that we will be looking at in a few years' time, once the changes have been actually been formally and properly proposed. Um, so, at the moment, it's a bit of a moving target, but it, it feels to me that there should be probably three options being placed before people to actually deliberate over. One is effectively not too different from what we currently have um, with uh, the community justice, criminal justice arrangements in place. One is something which completely integrates the justice social work, um, and but also has clarity about where the responsibility for leading community justice lies. And then there'd be something in between, probably. Um, what I would really uh, suggest one thinks about, though, is that these are really important issues. And we spent, as COSLA, something like two years in consultations over community engagement to deliver a significant element of legislation. Uh, we're not putting in as much effort in this area, which has to carry with it the, um, the approval or consent, at least, to develop further of the major stakeholders and partners who are currently there. We are far, far away from that at the moment and need to be pretty inclusive along the lines that uh, certainly the Unison representative Kate was saying. Um, so I'm quite keen to see uh, a workshop approach being adopted rather than just a blank piece of paper facilitated involving elected members, but also communities who face the front end of uh, disruption caused by um, criminal activities and offending. Uh, so that they also have an active role rather than this just taking part in a theoretical ether, which uh, is very difficult to engage with at the moment. Thanks, Kate. Yeah. Very much. Okay, thank you. I'm going to bring in Katie Clark and then Jimmy Green. Katie. Thank you. And I think it's come through very clearly from all of the witnesses that you feel there's a lack of detail in the proposals and the legislation itself is obviously an enabling piece of legislation. There's not a huge amount of detail in it in general, um, but it gives ministers significant powers um, to create a new way of providing a service. Um, now, it's been said that the inclusion of these sectors is overreach, given it wasn't included um, in the, the Feely report itself. Do, do, would you agree with that assessment? From, from a Social Work Scotland point of view, yes, that was, that, that was what we had said um, in our response, um, and as part of our consultation response. Um, it, it, we, we, we thought and we, we, we firmly believe that alongside our colleagues within children and families, justice social work should have been afforded the same opportunity, consultation opportunity that was that was um, given elsewhere. So, so yes, it, it, I would use the, the the phrase afterthought, and, and I, certainly if you if you're starting to think about how this is landing with staff and um, what the temperature is among social work offices, um, that that's certainly the, the strength of feeling that that's out there. And if I could ask Lindsay Smith um, another question. 
because I think, I mean, you said um, in your contribution that you, your view was that the status quo couldn't continue. Um, now, our, our understanding of how the National Care Service will work is that it won't actually provide a service, it won't employ any staff. It's not like the National Health Service. I think a lot of us who campaigned for a National Care Service were campaigning for a body that would provide a service, that would employ staff directly, um, that would provide a high quality um, of service. And our understanding of how it's going to work is that it's going to commission service services um, and that effectively it will put out tenders. And I'll ask Cosla about this in a minute, but I've been told by people in local government that it's unlikely that many councils will actually put in and participate in that process because of their own financial situations. So um, when you say that the status quo can't continue, what are your reasons for that? And is the, is, what's the top reason, if you like? Is the top reason because of the funding? So, so currently, um, so put the funding to, to the side, I think, cover the uh, call problem do you think lack of funding lack of resource at the moment i think it's consistency and service delivery for me um, from my perspective although i probably is on an equal footing to resourcing and funding but consistency in service delivery is key we currently have 32 local authorities who operate variances across the service and there's there's very good reason for that we're, we're dealing with some justice social work offices that are, are trying to offer a service across islands you know, so there, there absolutely is going to be variances in what service provision looks like across the country. But there, from a, a leadership point of view, from a Social Work Scotland point of view, we are, we're very aligned to the, the, the justice vision for Scotland and the, and the justice. So, that, so we, we would align ourselves with a lot of the principles around about prevention and, and early, early help for those who are in the periphery of the justice system but who we're trying to exit from it. And... Um, I'll give you an example. So we, we've rolled out electronic monitoring bail across the country. Um, that has been quite difficult to um, facilitate because we've, we've very much acted as a single point of contact within Justice Social Work to work with the 32 local authorities to um, introduce this change. Um, now, me as a chair... I don't have authority over local authority decisions, but we have used various methods of leadership to try and get local authorities to, or, you know, to a place where they're able to do that. Um, so naively, and uh, if you have one central point of contact that's potentially able to, to deliver and, and set direction clearer, then maybe that would offer something. But um, so that that's my main frustration. Um, can I maybe ask Cosla to come in on that, to comment on what's being said in terms of consistency, but also what they see the, the major challenges are? Is it resources and funding or is it, is it other issues? And also maybe to, to comment on to, to what extent there are discussions um, you know, in councils about how they would proceed if these proposals, as we understand, that they're likely to operate, go ahead... And, and what that means for the future of any of local government involvement in these kinds of services. There's quite a lot of detail in that and um, multiple questions. I'm not too sure I can, I'm in a position to answer those all, but trying to deal with the first one about consistency. I think certainly um, councils are quite keen on ensuring there is consistency in outcomes, not necessarily in services per se. And that, that, as Lindsay has already said, depends to some extent on geographies and how you meet the various challenges of providing services locally. Um, and you know, our view is that uh, managing uh, the local challenges is best done locally. And you will find some difficulties in cookie cutting services and applying them in local areas. And we uh, you know, contend that basically uh, the principle of keeping things as local as possible is not just uh, um, in terms of efficiency a best way of dealing with things, but it's also about community ownership of the issues that are there and making sure that accountability is maintained. So that is one of them, but clearly linked to that, as you've already highlighted, um, the lack of resources across the piece does happen to be an issue. Now, uh, we are more than aware, partly because we are told by 
chief social workers that there are difficulties within workforce retention, recruitment, uh, recruitment and retention. And I am not at all clear that those would necessarily uh, disappear once you have a national arrangement. Uh, it's equally possible to argue that having a single employer, if that is the way that that was going to go, and again, all very theoretical, would create the possibility of moving people around significantly, changing their terms and conditions uh, so that holes could be plugged across the country. That might itself act as a disincentive to people to work in the area. Um, if you'll excuse me, but I, I, I don't know the answers about commissioning and where the uh, local authority uh, and local government would wish to go. Part of the reason for that is that we haven't had firm enough proposals to consult with those who lead on community justice, criminal justice in local government. The last meeting we had to discuss some of the basic issues around this was a facilitated one back in November last year, when we had been taken a little bit by surprise by the last minute insertion of social work overall into the consultation documents um, and particularly the community justice and criminal justice. So um, I do know that elected members are interested in engaging. Uh, as a representative body, we would obviously want to bring those members together, which is one of the reasons why I was talking a little bit earlier about workshops as being probably an important way of getting into the sort of detail that you were discussing about um, the allied services for the multi-agency crime prevention uh, community justice approaches to actually be brought to the table and shoot over properly. Um, within the, you know, the broad area, we've highlighted uh, housing and employability as remaining with local government, but we also have significant uh, powers in terms of um, uh, contracts awards and trying to make sure that those are inclusive and help people um, be recruited who, um, uh, who are in danger of reoffending. Um, we also have welfare benefits, roles, access to resources, as well as obviously the education um, area on top of that. So there's complexities to this. But again, just going back to the principles, we are you know, actively involved in uh, national strategy for community justice. We want to see it delivered. We want to actually concentrate on what is trying to be done by way of a change so that the original observations from the cliche that we over over imprison people is starting to be dealt with rather than concentrating on structural reform I appreciate that you're speaking for COSLA and you um, because we don't have any detail it's very difficult for you to respond but if the, the model was a commissioning model and um, it, it, the responsibility was taken away from local government, so therefore local government would have to enter into a tendering exercise. Do you think there's a risk that local government or some councils may not get involved in that? I, I, Mike, can I, I just I just can I just come in um, and just ask uh, gently if witnesses can just keep answers as succinct as possible? It just allows us to ask as many questions as we can. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we, we would need to ask. I mean, I, I'm aware that uh, in the employability area, some councils chose to um, put in tenders for delivery of uh, services. Some chose not to. Some were successful as well. Um, the diversity will be there, and we'd need to consult. And, and could I maybe just ask Unison to come in on, on those points in terms of what they, they feel um, are, the, are the major problems at the moment in the sector and, you know, obviously reflecting on the comments made by other witnesses. Very much. The, I mean, the major pro problems in the sector that our members are telling about is a lack of funding. There's no doubt about that. Workers are talking about um, having to work huge amounts of overtime just to deliver a service um, over time that never gets repaid. Um, it's not like that everywhere, but there are real major pressures on the system. And morale is very low. And as I've already touched on, it's very difficult to recruit, but more importantly, to retain 
social work staff. So those are the kinds of issues that we think need to be addressed before we're trying anything else. Um, in relation to what you're saying about the potential for this bill, it does pave the way for extensive outsourcing and privatisation. There's no doubt about that. It enables that to go ahead. Um, and if that's the, and, and what it really says, if that happens, then criminal justice social workers and other social workers, for that matter, could have a change of employer every three years when services are tendered for. Now, whilst there's already huge pressures on the system, creating that uncertainty and upheaval in addition to that is not helpful at all in terms of the people trying to deliver the service now. Um, and I just, I, I do just want to touch on the fact that social work would, were included late to this party, and it has made our members feel very demoralised and devalued, really, that they were suddenly popped into that without any discussion about what it is that they actually do, leaving them feeling that maybe that's not properly recognised. So, yeah, I, I mean, I, I do think that the lack of detail is, is really concerning, but actually the potential that the bill leaves is even more worrying for privatisation and outsourcing. I appreciate the points you're making about tendering, and obviously Unison's got a huge amount of experience in the past from these kinds of outsourcing and tendering processes that have not been positive in terms of terms of conditions. But the, the point that was made by um, by Lindsay Smith was in, in relation to consistency of service, and I wondered if you had any thoughts in, in relation to that about the an inconsistent service uh, across Scotland, and whether you see that as a major concern, and how that might be addressed if it is a concern. There's a lot of talk about a postcode lottery, but actually. Because services are currently able to meet local need, that is going to create differences. And I, and I think what Anil said was that the differences are maybe an input rather than output. It's obviously an area that we'd want to be looked at as part of a consultation. But as I've said many times, and we'll see again, that consultation should happen before this bill is approved. That needs to be that needs to be a clean sheet. And that is something that obviously needs to be looked at. But I don't think we should be throwing babies out with bathwaters here because meeting local need is absolutely essential to social work. That's what we're about. Yeah, thanks very much. Okay, we're going to bring in Jamie Green and then Russell Finlay. Jamie. Thank you and uh, good afternoon uh, to our guests. Um, so, uh, just listening to that last exchange, it, it, this, is, this wasn't going to be my question, but it, I think it maybe should be. Um, given that at the moment local authorities uh, have statutory duties to perform these functions, in another model where a centralised, nationalised service either provides that service directly by employing people, becomes an employer of choice, or by some form of tendering or outsourcing or even direct awarding to preferred suppliers through a national contract or otherwise, it, it, it does sound to me a little bit like the end scenario may be some form of privatisation of services which are currently delivered by the public service, um, which sounds great if, if you're just about to buy shares in a private company who profits on that type of service, but it doesn't sound so great for those currently working in the service. Um, so I guess my first question is, this, is, is that a genuine risk or just a perceived one? And secondly, can I ask what representations you will be making next to the Scottish Government, given all the concerns that you've voiced today and before? And I'll maybe, I'll maybe start with uh, Unison first, if that's okay, and then perhaps ask COSL and Social Work Scotland to respond briefly. Um, I'm a social worker um, as well as a, a Unison representative. I work in children's families and children's rights. And um, that is a very good question about how statutory duties and responsibilities will be managed under a new system. And what I have to say to you is it's yet another thing that we just don't know. And it's another thing that creates quite a lot of um, stress and anxiety for our members, because we don't know how that's going to be managed 
um, at all. I mean, we don't even know how our pensions are going to be managed if we're taken out of local government. Um, so, you know, there's there's so many unknowns, and that's just another one. My colleagues might be able to say a bit more about it. In terms of representation, I mean, we 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 do engage at every opportunity with the Scottish government. Unison does to make the points that we've made here today on behalf of our members, because we do see it as such a fundamental change and, and such a threat to social work, because it's been implemented without doing the groundwork, without properly engaging with the stakeholders, as I've said before. So we will be continuing to make those, um, those arguments, um, and I hope as a committee you will do that too. Does that answer? Yeah, it, it certainly does. Very honest answer. Thank you. Um, Anil, do you have any comments on that? I suppose an observation, more than anything else, is that commissioning uh, and a commissioning approach locks in your current service provision. It actually uh, locks in all what you currently have, your strengths and your weaknesses. Um, whereas having something that is managed uh, more locally allows you to be much more responsive to what is going on. Um, so it solidifies things in my mind uh, and prevents you from revisiting your contracts every until your contracts are coming up for retendering again. So there, it, it will create some degree of um, uh, stasis in the whole system at a point when we are trying to see some fairly significant changes both in services and in public attitudes. Another issue that will then come up is who then will represent the workers and deal with the issues that they are facing uh, in delivering policies. So you'll get the uh, trades union side, but we as local government are currently working with the Scottish government and the UK government on matters around, for instance, FISA, the Violent Sex Offenders Register and access to information, how data is shared and so forth. These are all fairly significant service matters, which um, I would find difficult from where I stand at the moment to understand how these would actually work in practice. Um, the, the other bit that is also sort of, I think, still needing some elucidation is the notion of the uh, National Social Work Agency. It isn't something we'd necessarily oppose, something that is trying to develop uh, as uh, in terms of uh, training, standards, registration, and the like. But we don't see how this all fits in because, again, that lack of detail. Uh, Lind Lindsay, would you like to comment? Um, taking the cue from the convener, I won't speak a lot about it, but certainly we are raising these issues continually with the Scottish Government. They've set up a group, um, they're procuring the, the research at the moment, and we will be part of the panel who will assure that the research and the, the evidence as it comes through. So, um, Anil's part of that group, as is a, a number of justice stakeholders. So, yes. All those issues um, that we have raised today are, are being continuing to be raised with the Scottish Government. But I guess my direct question to you would be that does it does it does it feel like we're using a bit of a sledgehammer to crack it up? Because you talked about weaknesses and strengths in the system. Would it not be better to address those weaknesses directly, get to some of the core roots of some of the problems that social work and criminal justice social work is facing? Before introducing a, a new level of of of, of management, tier of management into the process, which may inevitably take work from local authorities and then give it back to them anyway, so it seems like an unnecessary, perhaps, or cumbersome step in the process. I think there's a huge argument to work with the the the, the, the system, the structure, the, the the set of governance arrangements that are in place just now. So yes, I, I think there is an argument to do that. Yes. Um, and I think as part of as the research and the evidence comes in and it evolves, then we, we probably will be better to place ourselves in, in, in whether we think that's the, the preferred option rather than you know, justice being included in the, the National Care Service. OK, and that, that was going to be my final question, and this could be a, a simple A, B or C, I guess. Um, would it be your preference that the bill in, in its entirety is paused to go back and perform some of that much needed consultation that you spoke of, or B, scrap it completely because you think the whole idea is completely bonkers, or C, simply remove the uh, criminal justice elements from the bill and let the rest of it proceed as normal. And I guess all those options are open to government as it chooses. Um, I'll do it in the same order, perhaps. Kate, first. I'm 
Sorry, we can't hear you. Um, oh. Yeah, you're okay now. Yep. Can you hear me? Yep. Yep. Yeah, I, I was saying that Unison's in support of a national care service, but you know we have a very clear idea of what that should be, and that is about social care, about providing status and better pay for social care workers, sectoral bargaining, etc. I don't think this bill um, does any of the things that we want it to do. Um, so, you know, I think Unison's preference would be to withdraw the bill and start from scratch, looking at, um, look, you know, building on the kind of good work that's already being done in relation to fair work, which we are very involved with and very positive about in relation to social care, but really starting from scratch in terms of our engagement with, um, with social work. Um, and with our members in social work and with the other stakeholders that I've talked about. So I can't remember what option that was, but you know that would that would be Unison's position. So somewhere between A and B, but that, thank you very much for that. Um, Kozla, do you have a, a view? I think we would be um, in favour of a fairly uh, radical return to what Feely was talking about, um, rather than the entered and slightly less coherent one which pulls uh, significant elements of social work into it um, so yes we, we we are equally in favor of some of the the fee recommendations overall but I don't think we would go much further how the Scottish government wishes to respond to the evidence sessions that have been underway um, is obviously going to be up to them but it will help us to know more uh, about their positionings um, once we get to the end of stage one, and then we'll probably be in a better position to say whether we're for or again. At the moment, it's it's too theoretical still. Only if you want to. No, I, I, I would agree. I think we've got a framework bill just now. I think um, we, what we would be arguing is that, you know, the, the co-design needs to happen first. So, yes, I, I, we, we would not be in favour of the, the bill continuing. I think the co-design needs to happen first so that we can form any future legislative process. That's very helpful. Thank you very much. Russell. Yeah, thank you and good afternoon to you all. Um, from what we've heard today, it sounds like the Scottish Government have not asked some pretty big questions, have um, sometimes asked the wrong questions and provided answers to some questions which can best be described as questionable. Um, I find it perplexing that justice social work was not properly consulted in this. And given the fundamental and pretty serious concerns you've all articulated, we are we're pretty clear on to what you want to see happening in answer to, to Jamie Green. But I suppose I want to take it a step back and perhaps ask why, uh, do we know why the Scottish Government chose not to listen to those who know best? And do you have confidence given what you've said today, that they will now do so? And you can answer that in any particular order. So, so I have confidence in the process that's been put in place just now. I think we are being meaningfully engaged around about the research um, and, uh, and we've helped shape the proposal that, that's been procured in relation to what, setting the questions um, that we want answered. Um, but we're at the start of this process. I think that's a question that I probably could answer with more confidence six months hence, 12 months hence. But, but certainly um, you cannot get away from the, the, the fact that we covered off earlier on that it feels like an afterthought. It feels as if um, we, we absolutely can see what happened with Feely and the thinking behind that. And, it, and you, I, think, I think it's right to then consider social work in the totality, including children and families social work and justice social work. Um, and I think we are where we are. But at the moment, we have felt engaged to the point. At the moment, we've, we've challenged that. We have questioned why we, we, we weren't included. Um, we, we've made it very clear that we, we, we do feel as if it's an afterthought. Um, so I will leave it at that. Yes. So. Amil, would you like to come in? And then Kate. The evidential base is not there. And that um, we were making the point earlier on 
uh, in the round of the consultation. What Lindsay has said is absolutely true. We think that the research that is being currently undertaken, which we are participating in, um, is helpful, is useful, but it's the wrong time to be doing it. It should have happened the other way around and been contemporaneous with Feely and also the work that's undergoing uh, around the promise. Uh, and then you get into the restructuring issues, but not this way around. So, um, yeah, I think that's enough. Um, I I can't speak for the Scottish Government, obviously, but um, so I don't know why. I, I mean, I, I suspect it's what Lindsay says that we were sudden. Well, we social work was suddenly included at the last minute, but I really do think they have to start listening now because if I don't know if you've had the opportunity to look at the responses to the National Care Service Bill. But all the issues that we have raised here today have been raised by many, many other other um, respondents to that. Um, and, I, you know, I, I really think that they have done it back to front and they now need to pull it back and do it the right way around and have the um, proper consultation now um, with social workers and service users and communities at the centre and hold the bill until that's been done, because the bill might look completely different after that. That's uh, very helpful. Thank you very much. Cheers. Thank you very much. Rona Mackay, would you like to come in? Thank you, um, convener. Um, yeah, I mean, first of all, just to say, I think we've heard some very valid points from all our witnesses today. Um, and I think the one thing we'd probably agree on is there's a consensus for change, because I think everybody agrees there are huge issues with the current system. Um, I do think it's a mistake to think that the government aren't listening to your concerns. I think they are. And I think from what you're saying, the, the issue is around timing. Um, and, you know, I, I, I get that, but I don't think there's any value in trying to backtrack and say, well, you know, I mean, we are where we are now. I don't think there's... Um, a possibility of the bill being rushed through and your concerns being ignored. Um, and always bearing in mind this is it's a framework bill to allow the government to start the process of change. And the co-design part of it is where you come in. And, I'm, and I, I get your point about timing. I'm, I'm not disputing that. So, so really, I mean, most of, of you know, you've, you've answered a lot of things and a lot of questions. So my question would really be if... Um, more consultation and engagement was offered to you at this stage, would that allay some of your concerns and could you, would it allay some of the concerns of, for instance, your members, um, Kate or, or, or yours, Lindsay um, and, and Cosla? Basically, I mean, that's just been realistic at the point we're at. Um, we'll start with Lindsay. Yes, it would. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, yes, I think um, it would give folk time to start to think through the mm -hmm. implications, the opportunities, the, the, the kind of positive and negative. So yes, to answer you, yes, I think it would offer a, a degree of comfort. It would, um, it would offer, it, it would offer, it, folk would then feel their voice was being heard and there would be part of a process. So yes. Thank you, Kate. Um, I'm not sure it would offer our members any comfort at all, because the trouble with an enabling bill is that it then leaves it totally in the hands of ministers, doesn't it, to determine what they do then. So consultation, co-design, they're, they're good words, but there's no obligation on Scottish ministers to then take them into account. Um, there's no obligation on them to... Um, listen to the concerns and act on them, um, they're just going to be able to do whatever they then think is the best thing for them. So I, th I think that's my problem if the bill goes through, that actually we're not going to have enough of a say um, on on how it's going to look, or, or we don't they don't need to give us enough of a say. That's the problem, because at the end of the day, um, the Scottish ministers will have all of the power over that. So, you, you know, Unison, you know, we'll have to look at, I mean, we will want to engage, obviously, but we would prefer to do it without the bill going through, because then we'll feel that, that it's genuine consultation, that they would be genuinely listening to our voices and that that would be included in the final outcome in the way that the independent care review took all of that into account. 
I'm just struggling to to sort of understand why it would be in the government's interest not to, you know, not just just to do their own thing and not not to listen to you because I don't think that's what's intended, because um, you know that 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 doesn't make much sense that they wouldn't take into account what you're saying. Um, and, and I, go, I go back to the issue of timing, which we can't really do anything about just now. But 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 thanks anyway. I mean, you make you make good points. Can I just say that they could pause the bill, even if they didn't withdraw it, they could pause it. That's what people are calling for, and they're not listening to that. So it doesn't give us a lot of confidence that they would listen to other things. Thanks. Anil, do you have a comment? Yeah. Uh, we're, not in, we're not skeptical about the willingness of those within the Scottish Government to listen to our concerns about criminal justice and community justice. Um, the consultation, uh, sorry, the, the uh, research work that is going on, and hopefully the consultation after, um, will hopefully provide very useful material for us. Um, but we do have shared competency in this area, and the fact is that the bill, as it's currently phrased, um, doesn't acknowledge that. It leaves to ministers the decision over where it goes. The best that we've been able to get, and I think it's still useful, is for the research um, findings to be presented jointly to both Scottish and local government. Um, I think the real issue, though, for yourself as a committee is um, whether you'd be satisfied with the degree of scrutiny of the process that you will have available to you should it go through as it's currently framed. Because you will just have the secondary legislation without the financial uh, memorandum attached to it. So um, your commitment and interest, I assume, is the same as ours to improving and transforming community justice. Uh, but a, a major factor in this will not have the degree of scrutiny that you would probably wish to have. OK, thank you. And for what it's worth, I think you know, workshops is a, it's a very good one. Um, that's me. Thanks, okay, thank you very much. And Colette. Hi there. Um, thanks very much, convener. Um, we, I actually asked earlier if the Minister for Mental Health could come forward and give evidence and, and, and scrutinise them based on um, the National um, Health Service Review. And I know he's been on other committees, but for this particular area, you know, in criminal social work, criminal justice and community justice as well, can I just ask what key questions this committee could ask of the Minister based on what you've told us today? And I'll start by asking Lindsay that question. That's a good question. Um, yeah, yes, it, again, it's, it's, it's difficult because it feels as if, you know, that this abstract, so you're almost, what are you... So I, I would be asking the minister about how he would see the, the vision for justice being delivered, um, if there's opportunities that he would see um, in a, an NCS structure that are not currently existing within local authorities. Um, I, I think you can't get away from the, 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 the finance and the... Um, and the, the, the resource issues that, that we're facing, I, I would be wanting to for him to consider what what opportunities he might see in relation to resourcing and the funding of justice social work within a national care service. So certainly they're they're two two big areas that I, I would um, I would be asking him. Can I um, pass it on to Anil as well, please? Thanks. Um. I'm not very au fait with the mental health area, to be honest, but what I think we would be doing is reflecting some of the other questions that have been raised, which is, is it better to spend the resources on restructuring or on services? We'll stop. Okay. Thank you. Do you want to bring Kate in? Yes, yeah, sorry. Uh -huh. It's just disappeared from the screen there. Kate, would you sure like to come there. in very briefly? Uh-huh. Yeah, I, I mean, I think we would agree with that. I mean, we know that mental health is a, is a big issue and a lack of mental health services is endemic across um, across the country. So, you know, again, I think we'd probably be wanting to ask whether it would be better to put 
resources into frontline services and developing those rather than putting money into this huge, potentially huge restructure. And so, yeah, just to echo the other, the other two. Thank you. No further questions. Okay, thanks no. very much. We're just slightly over time, so I think Fulton, you want to come in very, very briefly, and if I can ask for succinct responses as well. Hopefully I can help you out, Convener. It was actually just to make a point, rather than seeking any response. Um, it was on the back of uh, my colleague Colette's uh, question in there. I chair the uh, cross-party group in social work in this uh, parliament, and about, I think about a month ago, um, we did have Kevin Stewart, the minister, in front of us. Uh, for a very good session, I have to say, on the National Care Service, and he took a whole range of questions uh, from people excited and anxious about the proposals across the social work sector. So, at your um, it, it, up to yourself, convener, but I can make the minutes of that. They're, they're available anyway, but I can make the minutes available to committee members and panellists today, if it's helpful. Th thanks very much, Philip. And I think we would welcome that opportunity just to hear a little bit more about what was uh, discussed. So um, thank you very much. I'm going to have to bring this session to a close because we're just running over time. So um, I'd like to thank all our witnesses for uh, joining us today and just to advise you that um, we'll summarise the views that have been shared uh, this morning uh, and um, send them in a letter to the Health, Social Care and Sport Committee, uh, who are the lead uh, committee for this bill. So our next meeting uh, will be on Wednesday the 7th of December when we'll hear from the Cabinet Secretary for Justice and Veterans on the UK Government's Northern Ireland Troubles Legislation and Reconciliation Bill. Uh, and as previously agreed, we'll now move into private session. Thank you. <laughs>